Okay. <clears throat> I think we'll uh, try to start. Uh, nine o'clock seems quite challenging for some of you. So, um, with apologies to George, I'm just going to give a few announcements about uh, forthcoming events in the conference. Um, and please uh, pass on the information to those who aren't here already. Okay. So, first of all, we, we have a, an all-action program you might note from this point onwards. Okay, so tonight, it's great that we have the Groover, uh, the Groovy, no, the Groove, <laughs> the Groovy, uh, the Groover Prize Ceremony, okay, and this is the most valuable prize in cosmology, and it's a great honor to have this ceremony here as part of this meeting. So at six o'clock, after, you know, all, all the parallel sessions are uh, finished, we're all going to gather here and, and uh, listen to the listen to the awards ceremony and, and also the Gruber Prize Lectures by Slava and Alexei. Okay, so that should be quite an event. And then afterwards at 7 o'clock upstairs, there'll be a drink ceremony. So you're all invited to this uh, very I I interesting event. So do come along, please. Tomorrow night, there is the uh, public lectures by uh, Stephen Hawking, Andrew Little, and Brian Cox. Now, if you're from overseas, you probably haven't heard of Brian Cox but he's sort of a rock star here in terms of science communication. So he's a, a very entertaining speaker and, and well worth listening to. So please, uh, there are some tickets left for the public event, so if you haven't got tickets for that, uh, do go and see the registration desk. The same applies to the banquet tickets on Thursday night. So if you have a partner, spouse, or you haven't got a banquet ticket already, then they're 30 pounds up at the registration desk and they're highly subsidized, the, the banquets at Trinity College, um, Newton's old college, all right. Okay, so keep those two things in mind. The important announcement about this afternoon is that if you've got, if for the parallel sessions, sorry George, we're carrying on here, for the parallel sessions you've again got to put your talk on the memory stick if possible, okay? And so do that at, at, um, at tea time, all right? All right? All right, now. It's very, <laughs> it's very rare that we have a, a seismic shift in cosmology due to observational data, but it happens every 10 years. There was COBE, there was WMAP, and now there's Planck. And so it's great to see so many Planck members here representing the Planck results. And in particular, it's great to welcome Jean-Luc Pouget, the HFI uh, PI, who's uh, not actually giving a talk, but he's going to answer all the difficult questions, all right? <laughs> so the buck has to stop somewhere. And we've also got, uh, you know, that's <laughs> we also have George of Statio, who I'm getting to, who's the HFI survey scientist, and he's going to tell us about the results. So thanks very much, George. Thanks, Paul. <clears throat> so um, just a word about the title. The, the weirdest sensation being of my involvement in Planck was finally being able to talk about Planck to other people <laughs> when we had the papers out in, uh, uh, in March. Um, so um, I'll start with uh, my version of the history of the CMB. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have um, a satellite uh, designed to study the anisotropies of the cosmic microwave background in each of the last three decades. Uh, st starting with COBE, which discovered the uh, primordial temperature anisotropies, then followed by WMAP um, with their uh, f famous uh, data release in 2003, and then 10 years later followed by Planck. And of course, there are lots of little mammals here as well, uh, the small-scale CMB experiments, suborbital experiments as well, that, um, that were, cr I think, critical to our analysis of the Planck satellite. So you'll hear uh, about those experiments from, uh, from Joe and from uh, David Spergel. So, <clears throat> um, so what we released um, in March was uh, uh, the first 15 months of observations of Planck. Um, so that's just over half the data taken with the HFI, the, low fr the high frequency instrument on Planck. The low frequency instrument is still taking science grade data. And so these show the maps of the first 15 months uh, of the mission. Uh, so the low frequency instrument covered the frequency range 30, uh, 44 and 70 gigahertz, 
and then the high frequency instrument uh, covered the frequency range from 100, 143, 217, 353, 545, and 857. So <clears throat> um, all of the channels up to 353 um, have polarization information, and then these two channels, uh, we just have temperature information. So one of the things that you can see uh, from uh, th this plot, this set of maps, is you know, unlike the ease of press release, it's actually easy to see the primordial CMB anisotropies at frequencies 70, 100, and 143 above the galactic plane. You're seeing the primordial CMB anisotropies. And when you have this degree of frequency coverage, separating out the diffuse galactic emission on large angular scales from the galaxy is actually very easy. And that can be done to, to extremely high precision. Um, you see, at these high frequencies, we're not sensitive to uh, the primordial CMB at all. The, the, these frequencies, the temperature maps, are essentially signal-dominated maps of dust emission, uh, galactic dust emission and the cosmic infrared background from distant uh, infrared galaxies. So that's the, the uh, data that we worked with. Um, and then this is a, uh, a foreground subtracted uh, map as seen by Planck that is on, the, uh, <clears throat> on your uh, conference bag. Uh, and it's um, interesting, you know, the wisdom of the Planck science team to decide to choose a different color table than the WMAP team, um, because otherwise this map would have looked just like the WMAP map <laughs> <laughs> at this resolution. Now, um, I got criticized a, a little bit at the press conference for saying that uh, uh, you know, cosmologists would sell their children to get access to, <laughs> to this map. Um, but the reason uh, that uh, there's so much interest in this map is to see how much information we can extract out of this, uh, this map of the primordial sky. Every bit of information that we can extract tells us something about the very early universe at the time that these fluctuations were generated. So we can uh, look at uh, the three-point statistics. I won't talk about those um, here. Those are, are very high-precision measurements uh, from Planck. Um, what I will concentrate on are the two-point statistics, the power spectrum uh, from the uh, primordial CMB fluctuations. So this is the power spectrum. Uh, so first, on the top panel, you see a conventional plot of L squared C of L. Um, the blue points are the Planck uh, results. I'll say a bit more about those in a minute. Um, and the red line is the best-fitting six-parameter standard lambda CDM model that I will call the base lambda CDM model. And that provides a very good fit to uh, the observations. Um, so the, the fit is so good. I mean, there are error bars on these blue points. Uh, the blue points are band averages, uh, high multipoles in bands of width of delta L of 31. Um, and then the individual uh, power spectrum points, multipole by multipole, are shown by the gray dots. Um, so on this type of plot, you can't really see anything, it's pretty uninformative. And so when you get to the precision of Planck, it's more instructive to look at residual plots. In this case, um, just the difference between uh, the uh, blue points and the theoretical, best fit theoretical model. And that's shown here. Um, so again, the little gray points, uh, the power spectrum multiple by multiple, and then the green line here is our analytic uh, covariance matrix. Um, the diagonals of the analytic covariance matrix that we used for the likelihood. So the Planck likelihood is a hybrid. It uses uh, pseudospectra on the 100, 143, and 217 maps and all of the cross spectra that you could make from uh, independent maps. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, uh, so that's how that, that's constructed. And what I've done here is... Um, I've used a, a maximum likelihood way of combining 
the different uh, frequencies to produce our estimate of the primordial CMB spectrum. There is no unique primordial CMB spectrum because you also have to solve for unresolved foregrounds, which I'll discuss in a minute. And so, so you, you know, to, to get the uh, power spectrum, you have to do full likelihood analysis, assume a theoretical model, solve for the foregrounds, and then construct uh, the power spectrum um, after you solve for those parameters. Um, the low multipole part of the spectrum, up to a multipole of 49, um, is uh, computed from a component-separated map covering 87% of the sky. And this uses a Gibbs sampler to compute the likelihood at low multipoles. And then that's patched on to the high L part of the likelihood. So our claim in the first set of cosmology papers is uh, that the base lambda CDM model provides uh, a very good description uh, of what we see. Um, and that there's no evidence of any new physics apart from uh, the physics involved in the base lambda CDM cosmology. So that's the, the claim. Um, and uh, um, the, I think the only thing that uh, um, I would change from the first set of papers um, is that you see that over here at multiples of about 1800, there's a little dip. Uh, that is probably an, an instrumental artifact. Um, I'm not quite sure what I'm allowed to say about it, but, but Jean-Luc is here, so uh, you can, so he will field questions and give you the, the appropriate official uh, line. This has very li little impact on cosmological parameters. So our claim is that the basic uh, six-parameter lambda CDM model describes the data. There's one problem here that you can see that at low multipoles, um, the uh, data sit low compared to the best fit theory. So here, I mean, here at, at these low multipoles, if we substituted the WMAP uh, observations, um, you wouldn't be able to see any difference. The two experiments are in very good agreement. So that's a feature. There's nothing new here. Um, whoops, there's nothing new here. Um, th these sort of dip features were seen in the very first uh, results from WMAP. So I'll say a little bit about that later. So first, um, unresolved foregrounds. This shows uh, the spectra at different frequencies from Planck. These are the cross spectra that we used um, for the high multiple likelihood from Planck. Um, and you can see best fit theoretical model. And then at high multiples, you can see that there are excesses. The excess is quite strong for 217, cross 217 shown by the green points here. And those excesses come from unresolved foregrounds. So you have to, to recover the information about uh, early universe cosmology, we have to deal with these unresolved foregrounds. So the way that we deal with it is to have a, a, a model with lots of parameters. So um, we have uh, templates for the thermal sinyaev zeldovich effect from unresolved clusters of galaxies from the kinetic sinyaev zeldovich effect, from the cross-correlation between the thermal SZ emission and the cosmic infrared background. The cosmic infrared background um, expressed with amplitudes at, uh, at the frequencies where it's relevant. Poisson point source contributions, and then various other nuisance parameters, relative calibration parameters between the different spectra. And then these betas represent uh, the amplitudes of beam eigenmodes, because the beams are calibrated to a finite accuracy. So we, um, <clears throat> we have eigenmodes that express uh, the errors in our knowledge of the beams, and then we solve for coefficients. Now, in the actual likelihood that we released, the public we released version of the likelihood, we marginalized over all of these and kept beta 101, the first beam eigenmode at 100 for the 100 cross 100 spectra as a parameter, because that's the only one that actually showed any shift um, when we did an analysis of the full likelihood. So there are a lot of uh, parameters involved, and then you have your cosmological parameters in addition. Um, 
And we have control. We have some control on these parameters because we have uh, power spectra and likelihoods from, from ACT and SPT, that Joe will talk about later, covering the same frequency ranges. So these are the ACT spectra at 148 gigahertz, 148 cross 220, 220 cross 220, and then SPT at 95, 150, uh, 220. Um, <clears throat> and, um, and what you can see here is that the, the high-resolution ground-based experiments, they cover uh, much higher multiples. They go up to multiples of nearly 10,000, where you're totally dominated by the unresolved foregrounds. So we can use Planck on its own, solve for the foregrounds. We can use Planck combined with the high-resolution experiments, solve for the foregrounds and the cosmology. And as a general rule of thumb, um, if you see parameters shift between those two sets of analyses, with and without the high-resolution CMB experiments, then that indicates a coupling between the foreground model and the cosmology. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at consistency of the Planck data, so um, at 143 gigahertz, we have five maps, um, and so we can compute 10 cross-spectra from the five maps. And this shows the 10 cross-spectra superimposed on top of each other. And then this shows the RMS uh, deviation from the mean of these 10 cross-spectra. And then this shows, uh, so, the, uh, so this line here is not a theoretical model. It's just joining the dots. And this shows 0.2%, plus or minus 0.2% of the mean. <coughs> And so these spectra are remarkably consistent. Uh, they're consistent at low multiples to precision of, uh, of about 0.1%. Um, and uh, in this case, the, uh, the scatter is completely consistent with what we would expect from instrument noise. Um, <clears throat> at 217, we have six maps. And uh, so we can construct 15 cross spectra. This shows the same thing. Um, <clears throat> in this case, the, the 217 channel is noisier. Um, again, the consistency is, uh, multiples up to about 1,000 is consistent to about 0.2%. Um, and, uh, and in this case, the scatter is about half noise and half coming from uncertainties in the 217 gigahertz beams. So we understand um, the scatter in, the, in our data, and it's remarkably consistent. Um, here, uh, power spectrum differences. So this shows the 143 cross 143 minus 217 cross 217 differences. Um, the error bars here are coming from noise alone. And they're also in very good agreement um, you know, to within, uh, with a scatter of, uh, of 5 to 10 microkelvin squared. So the data is very consistent. Um, we didn't use polarization in the first uh, cosmology papers, um, but this shows the TE power spectrum from the 143 and 217 gigahertz channels. Um, so those are shown by the blue points. And the red line <coughs> isn't uh, a fit to the, this data. It's the expected TE spectrum from the best fitting base lambda CDM cosmology fitted to the temperature likelihood. And that provides an extremely, extremely good description of what we see. And then this is the EE spectrum, again from 143 and 217. Um, and as before, the red line isn't um, a fit. It's the expected EE spectrum from uh, the, the, uh, the temperature data. <coughs> So we showed these um, in the paper, uh, you know, partly to show off. Um, but also, it, it, there, there is an interesting science point as well, because uh, in computing these spectra, uh, we've assumed nothing at all about the unresolved foregrounds. So they're expected to be very low. So there's been no attempt to, to model or subtract polarized unresolved foregrounds. And the cosmology fits very, very well. So that's an additional check that uh, the cosmological parameters are not particularly sensitive to the foreground model. 
So here are the parameters of the base uh, lambda CDM model. <clears throat> and in many cases, the parameters are determined to uh, an accuracy that nobody's interested in anymore. Um, but th th some of these parameters raise some questions, and that's what I'm going to spend most of the rest of the talk on. Um, we've seen the uh, constraints uh, on inflationary models, the tensor scalar ratio uh, against the, uh, the spectral index. Um, <clears throat> so one and two sigma contours from Planck. Um, and our two sigma limit on the tensor scalar ratio is about uh, 0.11 when we combine with the barren acoustic oscillation data. Um, and really, this is not likely to, to improve until uh, we have uh, constraints, direct B mode constraints on uh, the tensor scalar ratio. With Planck, we've basically saturated what you can do on the tensor scalar ratio from measurements of the temperature and isotropies alone. Um, so that's, you will hear from John uh, later today uh, about uh, ground-based experiments to uh, uh, significantly improve on um, the tensor scalar ratio limits from Planck. <clears throat> so this uh, picture compares uh, Planck to WMAP. So the, the uh, Planck 100 gigahertz spectrum is shown by the purple dots here. Uh, these computations were, were done very carefully using um, exactly the same sky cuts, point source holes, and so on between uh, WMAP uh, and Planck. And this is the WMAP combined, combined V plus W spectrum. So it's computed on the same area of sky. Um, but we've applied a calibration factor. So there's a relative calibration factor of 2.7% uh, here. And with that calibration factor applied, then the WMAP and Planck points, this shows the residuals, they track each other extremely well. So these experiments are measuring the same thing on the sky. And so it's no accident that you know, if we cut back the sky coverage, uh, sorry, the, the multipole range of Planck, of the Planck likelihood to multipoles of about 1,000 or so, we get the same, we, we cover basically the same cosmological parameters uh, that WMAP find. But we find shifts in parameters when we use the full mul multiple range of the Planck likelihood. Um, the difference in the relative calibration <coughs> is not understood. Um, and that's a subject of uh, a lot of ongoing work. Um, but it's something that uh, I think should not worry uh, cosmologists. Okay. Um, so it's all to do with you know, far side lobes, how much missing solid angle there is in the far side lobes, and so on. So I'm not worried by this discrepancy. And you know, we uh, are trying to track it down. But there is a real possibility that we'll never be completely sure what the cause of that is. Um, so this is another part of the uh, Planck analysis, the temperature analysis. Um, this is the uh, lensing potential power spectrum. So that's constructed from uh, measuring the tri-spectrum on the Planck maps. So these show the lensing potential power spectrum points from Planck. And this band here, the line and the band, shows the plus or minus one sigma range uh, of what we would expect from the Planck parameters for the base uh, lambda CDM cosmology. And then this shows the residuals below. And so that's compatible with, uh, with our measurements. There's no statistically significant evidence of any uh, difference there. So the Planck base cosmology fits the lensing power spectrum from Planck. So going back to this, let me say a little bit about this discrepancy here at low multipoles. Uh, we blow up the low multipole region. These are the Planck measurements. And then this shows, uh, th this band basically shows you the range um, of the power spectrum that's allowed by fits to the base 
Lambda CVM cosmology. So the data hasn't changed from WMAP, but the precision of the theoretical constraints on the model has changed. And so you see that, that uh, um, there looks to be, uh, that, that the theory predicts a higher amplitude than the data. Now we try to quantify this by computing a relative amplitude from the Planck likelihood, the low L Planck likelihood, a relative amplitude of the theory to the data when we cut the likelihood up to a certain value of L max. Okay, and so that's shown here. So if everything were fine, these points would be sitting around one. Um, and this is L max on the bottom. And this shows one and two signal ranges. And so you see that uh, uh, there's a formally sort of 2.7 sigma discrepancy at a multiple of about 30. So is that indicative of a problem? Um, I'm not sure, um, because this isn't a particularly high level of significance. And um, you know, I mean, I, I don't know how to do look elsewhere statistics. My joke about look elsewhere statistics is if anybody uses them, then you should look elsewhere. Um, so it's possibly indicative of some problem okay, between the theory and observations. But I don't think it's, it's uh, by any means compelling. But the effect of this, it does pull parameters. When you, when you solve for, uh, for cosmologies um, with extensions to the lambda CDM model, then, then this discrepancy in amplitude between the low multiple uh, part of the likelihood and the high multiple part does tend to pull parameters. So one should be aware of that. So looking at other observations, <coughs> um, this shows uh, the ratio of the Baron acoustic oscilla oscillation scale divided by um, a combination of the angular diameter distance and the Hubble parameter uh, of uh, redshift surveys. Um, so, that, so this dimensionless number is what uh, galaxy redshift surveys determine, um, divided by the value expected from the Planck uh, best fit cosmology. Um, so here are the data points from a number of surveys, redshift surveys. Um, and then this is the plus or minus one sigma band allowed by Planck. And that's an extremely good agreement with Planck. Um, so we have very good agreement between Planck on the base lambda CDM cosmology and the Baron acoustic oscillations. But we started to find uh, an, you know, some tensions with other data sets. So this shows um, the uh, magnitude redshift diagram residuals from the best fitting lambda CDM cosmology um, for a, uh, a bunch of uh, type 1a supernovae surveys. So this is a compilation produced by the Supernova Legacy Survey Group. Um, so what it shows is low redshift supernovae here, then Sloan Digital Sky Survey supernovae here, then their SNLS supernovae here, and then a few uh, HST measured supernovae at high redshift. So, um, <clears throat> so this, is, this band shows the plus or minus two sigma range allowed by Planck. And you can see that it lies systematically low. And so what we found was a two sigma tension uh, between the supernova data and the Planck data. And it does pull parameters. So for example, if you solve for dark energy uh, with a constant equation of state, you get minus 1.13 plus minus 0.13 at 95%. So there's two sigma pull into the phantom domain. Uh, Planck, uh, WP by the way is WMAP polarization. Uh, Planck combined with the BAO data, the WMAP polarization, gives us something that's perfectly compatible with the cosmological constant. Okay. So we were suspicious of that this might be uh, an effect of, uh, of um, systematics in the supernova data. And in fact, that was right, because um, after, just after we presented our results, the SNLS team told us of uh, a campaign that they had to recalibrate uh, the photometry from the SNLS sample with the STSS sample. And in 
uh, that uh, analysis, what they found was uh, uh, an error in a color transformation uh, for the uh, SDSSG band photometry. And with the correction of that error, this discrepancy goes away. Okay? So that revised data is not yet publicly available, but we can anticipate what it will do because the supernovae are intrinsically more sensitive to W than this combination of data, is it'll pull W closer to minus one with a smaller error. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so uh, one of the uh, results that uh, caused uh, quite a lot of debate internally, so with collaboration and externally, uh, was the low Hubble constant from Planck of 67.3 plus or minus 1.2 compatible but a little bit lower than WMAP. And then these are direct measurements of the Hubble constant uh, from Cepheid period luminosity relations, uh, the old HST key project results, and then a number of other geometrical techniques that I won't describe. So <clears throat> um, is that a significant discrepancy? It's a you know, two and a half sigma discrepancy. If you add the Hubble constant to Planck, you get pulled towards new physics, and particularly in the neutrino sector, um, at the sort of two and a half sigma level. So is this right? Well, um, <clears throat> I've spent some time looking at this. Um, so, uh, so this is my analysis now <laughs> of the reset al Cepheid data. So, um, <clears throat> so the way this works is, uh, so these are observations of um, <clears throat> these are dust corrected magnitudes in the H band measure, measured by uh, with the Hubble Space Telescope, plotted against the period of the Cepheids. Um, all of these red Cepheids are accepted in the fit. The blue Cepheids have been rejected from the fits because there are oddball objects. They may not be classical Cepheids. Uh, there may be uh, <clears throat> problems with crowding in the photometry, even at the resolution of the Hubble Space Telescope. There may be Cepheids in binary. So there are many reasons for why you will get outliers in this type of analysis. And so, um, so you need to uh, reject, use a rejection algorithm to reject outliers. And one of the things that I noticed about the reset al analysis was their rejection algorithm uh, re favored measurements with large errors that lay close to their relations. So they get low chi-squareds and so on. So I didn't think that was very good. So I didn't develop my own. Uh, the blue points are Cepheids that are rejected by both Reese and by me. Uh, the blue points of uh, sorry, the open symbols are Cepheids that are accepted by me but rejected by Reese. Okay, and then the red ones are accepted by both of us. And so the way this works is that you uh, have uh, observations in uh, the period luminosity relation in something that you, ha you know the distance to, in this case using NGC 4258, which has an, uh, an accurate mega maser distance. Um, and you compare the uh, period luminosity relation of this object, with the distance that you know, to uh, more distant galaxies with supernovae. So that gets you the distances to these galaxies. And then you use the supernovae, uh, you match those on to more distant supernovae and determine the Hubble constant at large distances, free of the, the Hubble flow. So the precision that you have to do this to, um, the dotted lines here show a plus or minus two kilometer per second shift in the Hubble constant. So you've got to get these zero points accurate to that sort of level. Okay, so, um, so here are the results of my analysis. Um, just after the Planck results came out, there was a new maser distance to NGC 4258. Um, so the new maser distance um, changed the distance to 7.6 megaparsecs 
uh, from 7.23, which is what Rees uh, et al. assumed. So that instantly lowers the Hubble constant. Um, and so these are the results using NGC 4258 as an anchor distance. Uh, for different assumptions of different priors on the slope of the period luminosity relation and the metallicity dependence of the relation. Okay, so no priors, then weak prior, strong prior, so on. I won't go into the details. But you see the results uh, using NGC 4258 are all stable at around you know, 70.5 plus or minus 3, something like, like that. So that's perfectly compatible with the Planck value. No... no uh, significant tension. Then you can also use the LMC, Cepheids in the LMC as an anchor, and I've used a revised new eclipsing binary distance to the LMC, and these are the numbers that you get. And now what you see is that the numbers change a lot depending on what sort of prior you put on the uh, metallicity. And Wendy's here, and Wendy would argue that the metallicity dependence is very weak. Okay, at, in H band, um, from an analysis of uh, metallicity dependencies of LMC cepheids. Uh, but the data with no priors pulls you to, to low values of the Hubble constant. There are definitely in the Reese data low metallicity cepheids that are subluminous compared to the rest. And so you pull out a metallicity dependence that is actually discrepant with what Wendy finds. So that's the problem with using the Large Magellanic Cloud. Then the Milky Way parallaxes um, give a high value. Okay, and you can see that now there is tension between this value and the Milky Way parallaxes. And in fact, you can use the Milky Way parallaxes to get a distance to NGC 4258, and then that becomes discrepant at nearly the two sigma level with the new mega maser distance. So the data is not all brilliantly self-consistent. Okay, so, um, so just to show you, uh, this is, these are the Milky Way Cepheids with parallax measurements. Uh, these are the distant supernova, uh, the supernova host galaxy Cepheids. And you see that these are all low period Cepheids. There's only one that overlaps in period range with, um, uh, with the supernova hosts. And you slightly change the prior on the slope, and the Hubble constant goes down a lot. So what are we to make of this? Um, if, uh, if it were up to me, I would uh, split the H0 measurements into an NGC 4258 prior and something else. Okay, they, they differ. Then this shows um, parameters from Planck. Um, the green points of Planck plus uh, WMAP polarization. And the blue points were our favored data combination of Planck plus WP plus HIL plus BAO. For different um, models, different, uh, so this one has massive neutrinos, massive neutrinos plus curvature. Then, uh, additional relativistic species, neutrino-like particles, N effective plus sterile neutrino mass, N effective plus M nu. Um, so uh, the, the interesting thing about this is that, and th this is a point that I think you know, is not actually properly appreciated even within the Planck collaboration, is that these data combinations are not biased against new physics in these models. But yet there's no pull towards high values of the Hubble constant. Okay. So unless there's a problem with these data, then uh, the conclusion is that there's no evidence for any new physics in the neutrino sector from Planck. Everything is compatible with the NGC 4258 distance, and there's tension with the Milky Way plus the LMC. And I think that's a fair reflection of where we are. There are other uh, problems. Uh, the sigma-8 problem uh, from clusters from Planck detected from the S-Z effect, which give 
a constraint on the amplitude of the fluctuations. Again, stoma good matter give plus or minus, uh, sorry, give one and two sigma contours shown by the uh, blue lines and constraints from the Planck primary CMB that give a higher value of sigma eight. That's also a sort of, you know, three sigma-ish discrepancy. Um, is it caused by problems in the physics of clusters that we don't properly understand, in particular the relationship between uh, the uh, mass of clusters and their SZ flux. Um, so a num number of people have written papers uh, since we uh, released the data uh, on uh, evidence for new physics coming from that sigma eight discrepancy. Um, so here are some plots from a paper by Batty and Moss. Um, so th this shows the uh, lensing potential power spectrum from Planck, as the green points, and then SPT as the blue points. And an interesting thing from this is that um, is there a tension between the SPT data and the Planck base lambda CDM parameters, okay, which we, we haven't looked at. And then this shows uh, the weak lensing uh, shear spectrum from the CFHT lensing survey. Th these results came out too late for us to analyze in the March papers. And again, the prediction from the base lambda CDM cosmology. And so these points sit low. And so is, are these discrepancies symptomatic of a problem with sigma eight? And that's the problem that Batty and Moss asked. And then this detailed table here of different combinations of data. Um, so uh, I'll be quick in the analysis here. So two sets of models analyzed active neutrinos and sterile neutrinos. So this is just you know, masses of active neutrinos. Um, so with Planck plus the BAO, you get a two sigma upper limit of 0.25 EV on the mass of neutrino. When you combine with the lensing, and that is all of the lensing, CMB lensing plus CFHT lensing, plus the SZ constraints from Planck, then you find possible evidence of a neutrino mass. But what you also see is that this value is you know, outside the two sigma range of this data combination. So maybe it's right, um, or maybe it's reflecting problems with the lensing and SZ data. Um, when you add sterile neutrinos, you see a similar thing, um, that uh, uh, when you add the lensing data, you start to see evidence of, um, of a sterile neutrino mass. And when you add in the SZ constraints on the sigma eight and omega m, then that becomes a nearly three sigma evidence of a sterile neutrino mass. But again, this value is uh, you know, two sigma away from uh, the limit set by this data combination. So again, probably reflecting, possibly reflecting tensions in the data. This is reflected in the likelihoods. The, the, the CMB and the BAO likelihoods do not want any new physics. The new physics is coming entirely from the lensing and the SZ. Okay, so I have uh, got to the end. Um, so um, I s sent some of this stuff on the Hubble constant work to Adam Rees, who said, I think you're trying too hard to uh, reconcile the data with Planck. And I refute that charge completely. Uh, he also said that tension is healthy. It's the only way we can find new physics. And I agree with that. But tension can also indicate crap in the data. So theorists should beware of astrophysical data. It's less clean than the CMB. And if it were up to me, I would not allow theorists to use H0 or supernovae if you don't know what a distance modulus is. <laughs> so for observers, convince us that tensions are not caused by systematics in your data. And that applies equally to us on Planck as it does to other observers. And so I welcome you know, any uh, evidence of problems in the Planck data or unusual things that we 
need to look at in more detail. Um, and always be suspicious of papers that combine lots of different types of data. If you, you know, if you throw everything into the mix, then it's very, very likely that you will get crap out. Okay? <laughs> so those are, that's what I really wanted to, to you know, for you as an audience to come away with. <laughs> um, on extended Lambda CDM models, I really strongly, strongly support what we did in the Planck papers, thank you, <laughs> uh, of using Planck plus the barren acoustic oscillations, because this is a very simple geometrical measurement, to set constraints on extended models. And there's no evidence from these data for any new physics beyond the six-parameter lambda CDM cosmology. And then finally, um, Planck is a, a large collaboration, and I want to uh, acknowledge the contributions from all of these institutions. Um, this poor institution has a very bad logo, uh, but it's been a, a large effort, so I'll end there. Right, are there any questions? I'm sure there's some. And remember to wait for the microphone if possible. Okay. <coughs> Quick question. Uh, the Milky Way CFH is crappy data or I'm sorry? good tension? The Milky Way discrepancy with the CFH, uh, the Milky Way CFH discrepancy of the Hubble constant is crappy data or uh, good tension? <laughs> well, it could, be, it, it could be a number of things. I mean, the, the, uh, um, the so, you know, there's this lack of overlap in period in the period luminosity relation. That will be killed by Gaia, okay, because Gaia will measure many thousands of uh, galactic seconds with accurate parallaxes and so on. Uh, but even then, you've got to worry about uh, differences in uh, in crowding, because uh, these cepheids are observed in crowded fields. Um, and there are very substantial crowding bias corrections involved in, in, uh, in these measurements. You have to worry about differences in, uh, in photometric systems and so on. So there are a number of issues. Um, the reason that I favor this comparison is because um, when you're doing this relative comparison, you're not so sensitive to differential crowding differences. You're not sensitive to metallicity differences. And even the rejection algorithms, they're performing, they're doing basically the same thing. Okay, so, so that's why I think that inherently this is probably the safest. Um, so, yeah. We had a question from Ofa. Uh, George, it's a generic question about uh, Nuisance parameters, you know, it's something we all struggle with in, in various cosmological data sets. Should we feel comfortable that we fit the whole universe with six parameters and then add had hundreds of nuisance parameters to the analysis? Well, why? why? Why do you say that? I mean, you know, that's the real world. You have to deal with the real world as you find it, not as you would like it to be. <coughs> so you have to deal with it. Well, ideally, you'd like to model for nuisance parameters, right? This right. would be the ideal scenario. Mm -hmm. When you don't have it, yes, you have to put hundreds of parameters, but then the question, you know, it's parameter degeneracy. And the question is the stability, yeah, yeah. Well, we, we the stability can, of the result. We, we, we can study that. I mean, that's, well, that's one of the, 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 the reasons that I think it's, it, you know, it, it's really good to have the high L experiments because, because Planck on its own is, is not very constraining, particularly for minor foreground parameters like the kinetic SZ and so on. Um, what happens when you use the Heil experiments is that, that um, you, you, uh, you pin down those parameters and it leaves basically point source amplitudes with a spectrum that we know free for Planck. And it doesn't make very much of a difference. They don't couple strongly to, to the cosmology. But if you go to, to models which are highly degenerate, in the CMB, particularly with, with N effective, then you start to see couplings come in. Okay? 
And, th th you know, that's the, the, the only way out of that is to improve the polarization measurements to the point where they become really very competitive with the temperature measurements, and that will happen. And then you have wonderful sensitivity with a lot, you know, to cosmology with a lot less sensitivity to foregrounds. Our time is short, but we have another question over there. Yes? Just to follow up on the question, George expects me to disagree with them, but I don't. <laughs> um, but the Milky Way data are not crap. I think that's an unfair characterization. The, the parallax data are a big improvement over what there was before. But, and where I really agree with George is Gaia is going to make this better, including the period range over which the Cepheid period luminosity relation, relation can be carried out to. And, and, and I think, and also for the R library, so there'll be an independent check of the systematics. And, and systematics are the name of the game. Uh, but what's really changed is, is there are now spectroscopic abundances for Milky Way and LMC Cepheids where you can look at some of these systematics in, in, in a lot of detail. And I think these tensions are healthy, and systematics is the name of the game. But there's a huge amount of data coming down the pipe which will uh, address yeah. these issues. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing that, you know, one of the most important things that I learned from doing that study was that, um, you know, the, 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 the Reese data has a metallicity dependence in it. That data has a metallicity dependence in it. And it's actually quite extreme. So it's almost certainly not right. Yeah, I mean, the other thing is where there are crowded regions, it's sometimes hard to disentangle metallicity from crowding effects but because they're coupled. Yeah. The inner regions yeah. are more are yeah. crowded and higher metallicity. Right. All right, one last question. Okay, <laughs> and then uh, Joe, could you start setting up if that's all right? Sorry. Yeah. George, so one way to resolve the low L discrepancy and also uh, sigma A discrepancy is to actually lower optical depth because that, uh, that will force you to lower sigma A as well. And uh, have you looked at that for, for all low L? Uh, well, uh, you're relying con entirely on W map. Yes, there, yes, yes. Right? We're relying entirely on W map and we're still relying on W map. So, um, but, but I think that the change that you would need to solve that problem requires, you know, just too large a change in the optical depth. You only have, you know, e to the minus two delta tau to, to yeah, play with. Yeah, for low L, all you need is change of 0.02, right? That's all you need. No, I, 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 That's one and a half sigma. Well, we, 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 we can talk about this, but I, I, I thought it was just probably too large to, to blame it all on on optical depth. But hopefully we will see. Okay, um, well, let's thank our speaker again. And, uh, and, and those at the back, please take the opportunity to come down and fill up the spaces that are still available at the front and uh, in the middle. So could everyone squeeze up a little bit and uh, make more space? Okay, so it's a, it's a great pleasure to welcome Jo Dunkley from Oxford, and she's going to tell us about cosmology from the small-scale CMB. Thanks. Okay, so I'm going to um, go into a bit more detail on some of the cosmology that we're now able to do um, by having probed the CMB to much higher angular resolution than we had just a few years ago, um, both from, from Planck but also from um, the ground-based experiments. Um, so. If we're thinking about the small-scale CMB, and I'm kind of roughly going to talk about small-scale CMB as things smaller scale than WMAP, because <laughs> that's what we had a few years ago, and now we've moved on from that. Um, and so we're talking about scales um, sub a fifth of a degree or so in the sky, and we're measuring now the CMB to um, you know, arc minute resolution or a few arc minutes. <coughs> when we measure the CMB at uh, high resolution, we're actually probing two epochs now. We're probing the register of a thousand recombination epoch, um, and we're just we're then looking at the usual um, acoustic oscillation physics, um, and we're looking at the silk damping uh, that comes from the acoustic oscillations being washed out during the recombination process if they're very small scales. But now we're also looking at uh, late time physics because the CMB is gravitationally lensed, as George um, showed the data of from Planck. Um, the CMB as a backlight gets. 
uh, distorted by all the large scale structure in between us and the signal gets coherently distorted. And that's picking up mainly signals that dominate at redshift about one to three, but really you're picking up uh, large scale structure all the way from recombination to today. So you've got these two different um, measurements. So I'm gonna talk about results from, um, from two experiments that I've been working on. One is um, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope um, led by Lyman Page in Princeton. And we're also gonna talk by Rene Logic this afternoon um, on that. Um, as well as Planck, which we've already been hearing uh, from George. Here's the <laughs> slide of all the contributors. Okay, so we've now got this enormous dynamic range of scales that have been probed by the CMB. We've already you've already seen the plot from from Planck. Um, this is our um, this is our final power spectrum measured of the CMB by by ACT earlier this year. Um, and and as, as usual, I'm showing the power spectrum against multipole here and now on a log scale where the blue data points are doubly map and the red data points are, are ACT. And it's going all the way from L of 500 actually out to, we're seeing, we're seeing the CMB or can extract the CMB out to um, almost L of 4,000, which is actually well beyond where Planck can go. So Planck is going out to uh, about 2,500 here. As, as George mentioned earlier, this, isn't, this, this, C, this, this spectrum is the CMB itself with any extra foregrounds and nuisance parameters already marginalized over, um, removed, and with their uncertainties propagated into those errors. So what you're seeing there is just the CMB. But the only way we can get that is by going measuring the CMB all the way out to even small angular scales um, and fitting for these, for extra galactic foregrounds, fitting for effects from clusters, from point sources. Um, but I actually, I have, I have great confidence that we're, we've been able to do that. We've done a huge amount of tests of different models. You do that, you fit them, you remove them, and what you get back is just the primary uh, lensed CMB. And so we're seeing now um, nine acoustic peaks in the power spectrum. And beautifully, we're seeing the, the silk damping um, where what we see is just bang on with lambda CDM, and that's what George already, already mentioned that that what we're not seeing is, is power that's coming up here or down here or, or wiggling in a different way than we'd expect from Lambda CDM. It's really, it's really bang on. Um, so we can then look at the, com the, the current sort of compilation of, of all this, the small scale measurements, including, including Planck as well. And Planck then, then beautifully gets the L of less than 2500 range um, that George already showed. This again is now on the log scale up here. And in red is Planck. Uh, the blue points I just showed you from ACT are underneath and very consistent. And in yellow are measurements from the South Pole Telescope, which has also um, been measuring the sky at small scales. So we're seeing right out to L of 3000 and beyond um, in the CMB. There's really great consistency between these data sets. Planck is fantastic, but we've used, for doing Planck analysis, we have, as George said, used information from ACT and SPT. And even before Planck, we're see, we were seeing um, this, these small scale features from, from ACT. I just wanna show you quickly and go back and then go back to the previous slide that it's not enough just to say that the power spectra agree. We've got these different observations now of the high resolution CMB um, that are, incredibly consistent. And this is showing you just new results um, of the cross correlation between the region of sky observed by the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, which is roughly 600 square degrees, um, cross correlated with the same overlapping region of the sky seen by Planck. Because we wanna see if we're seeing the same signal. Um, and we are. What I'm showing you here is um, the power spectrum in the range L of 500 to 2000 um, of the ACT power spectrum and the cross correlation between ACT and Planck. And they're incredibly consistent um, and um, agree really very well. And that's saying we are seeing the same sky um, by these different experiments. So with these, with these small scale features, we can now ask a number of questions. Um, we can probe inflation, test inflationary models, um, we can ask about dark energy, whether we have any evidence for um, a dynamical component in it. 
We can ask about what are the masses of the neutrinos. We can also question, are there additional relativistic species that we can see in the universe? Or are there actually other high energy signatures that we can see? Because by having all of these features in the power spectrum, uh, you know, going from three acoustic peaks to, to nine is, um, uh, is helping us a huge amount. So let me just explain, show you a few examples of how um, measuring those small scales can help us test early universe physics. Now, I know that the, big, the main result is we don't see any new evidence of physics, but that just means that we have to try a bit harder. You know, we heard yesterday that you know, Susie hasn't been seen yet at LHC. You don't stop looking. Uh, there's so many things we don't understand in cosmology that we just need to now keep uh, looking and looking um, harder and harder for signatures of, um, of physics that could explain some of our outstanding questions. Okay, so what can you do? How can you do... What things can you probe by measuring more acoustic peaks and smaller scales? The first thing is your um, testing recombination, and you can test things that affect the contents of the universe. We usually assume just a simple, our simple lambda CDM model, but you can change the contents of the universe. You can put in different numbers of neutrinos, different amounts of helium. Um, you can put in a modified dark energy model that, for example, has early dark energy, a fraction of dark energy at early times. Um, you can also put in... Um, additional physics like a dark matter component that annihilates and affects the recombination process um, by adding in um, extra sources, by changing the ionization fraction of the universe during recombination. Or you can vary the constants of nature and say that that's going to that's vary too. Those things will all affect the acoustic oscillations and the silk damping process during recombination. So you can test those. The second kind of class of things you can test is by extending the angular range that you see the CMB over, you can just simply probe the primordial power spectrum over more decades of scale. Um, and that will tell you things about the spectral index and it's running, the running of the index, the scale dependence of the spectral index. And by going to these small scales too, you can also probe scales where non-standard fluctuations might show up. So usually we assume that the fluctuations are adiabatic, um, but you could also have isocurvature contributions. You could also have contributions from cosmic strings, um, for example. Um, and these will show up at, at small scales. And then below that, I'm just, I'm sh what I'm showing you is an illustration of three examples of that. This power spectrum has been scaled by L squared to um, bring out the higher acoustic peaks. Um, and here it's now ranging out to L of 3,000 or so. So this L... L to the 4, so this is now an L to the 4 CL plot, where these three first acoustic peaks are the ones probed by WMAP. And then these higher acoustic peaks are the ones probed, and, and on here I'm showing the ACT results, um, but then Planck now nicely covers the ranges out to here. Lambda CDM is shown in the dashed curve, together with three models that are essentially indistinguishable at these larger scales, L less than 1,000, but show up quite dramatically differently at small scales. Um, the first one has a strong negative running of the spectral index, a strong scale dependence that we wouldn't expect from, from simple inflation. Um, and if you have that, then you can fit the data or agree with the data at large scales, but then you'll increasingly damp your spectrum at small scales because your primordial fluctuations are just dying off if you've got a strong negative running. The next model has 10 neutrino species rather than just the usual three. Um, that also affects the spectrum, and I'll say a bit more about that um, in the next slide. We also have a universe which has double the amount of helium uh, that we expect from standard BBN. Again, that damps the spectrum, and we see it looking completely different to the one probed by the data. Um, so this information can be used to really significantly improve um, constraints, even if we're not seeing signatures of new physics yet. So let me, go, let me just go into a bit more detail on those. <coughs> um, primordial helium, again, we usually assume that BBN uh, is right. And as soon as you know the baryon density in the universe and the number of neutrino species, you can say exactly what the helium fraction should be. Um, and so we usually fix it at um, point, 0.24 or 0.25. 
Um, but we can vary it and, and, and use it to test BBN instead. Um, and this shows the power of using the, the small scale data because this is the distribution of the helium fraction um, measured, first of all, using just the WMAP data. You can see it's very broad and includes this point at 0.5, um, double the helium fraction we'd expect. It's not excluded by the data. But as soon as we add the small scales from, from ACT, that shrinks down significantly um, and goes towards something that looks in pretty good agreement with what we would expect from BBN. That is shrunk even further with Planck. Um, and over here, so I'm showing you the constraints on the helium fraction against baryon density um, from Planck, combined with the high L experiments too. Um, and we're now getting a helium measurement that's, you know, 2%. And it's becoming, you know, comparable to that band. This, this is the band of direct measurements um, of, the primordial, of the helium fraction from BBN itself. Um, and that's looking rather consistent. This is only going to improve. So, so the reason we can see it so well is that um, it's very, you know, you increase the helium, you decrease the um, electron density, and you just increase the mean free path of photons during recombination and increase the silk damping. So it's a very simple effect on the spectrum. And having polarization as well, where you're also measuring the damping scale, will help that too. So this is something that will continue to be better measured from the CMB. But as yet, it all looks, that looks consistent with BBN. Relativistic species, this is something that's been of a lot of interest in the last few years because um, earlier measurements from small scale experiments were hinting at the fact that there might be more than three species in the universe. Um, so what we usually do in cosmology is we assume three neutrino species, but we can vary the amount of relativistic density. And we do it by, we don't say it's neutrinos. We just say, uh, I'm allowed to tune the knob that tunes the amount of relativistic density in the universe, stuff that doesn't couple to baryons. It doesn't have to be neutrinos. Um, and in, in our analysis, we're not assuming it is neutrinos, but we then usually call it an effective number of species as something that looks like neutrinos. Um, if you boost up the amount of relativistic stuff, uh, you have a longer radiation domination period, which shifts the acoustic peaks. You also suppress um, the acoustic oscillations because you've got stuff that's now not coupled to the baryons. Um, and you also add a small phase shift in the CMB at small scales because you've got perturbations that are propagating at the speed of light rather than the speed of sound in your cosmic fluid. And all that means that you then, it shows up quite significantly different at small scales. And again, this is, this is the a plot from the, the final act analysis showing how much you then reduce the distribution from WMAP down to one from the combination with WMAP and ACT that's much more tightly constrained. And from ACT and WMAP came out to be just under three plus or minus 0.5. And combined with SPT as well, just over three plus or minus 0.4. And then with Planck, um, we get a very consistent number of just over three with an error bar that's one sigma away from three. So this has been a really strong improvement in the, just the last few years. And if we look at it on the plane of the number of species against the baryon density, this is the Planck constraint here. And these are the primordial BBN, the, or the BBN measurements um, of helium and deuterium from direct measurements. And so now our constraints from the CMB are tighter than the ones from, um, from um, BBN measurements. Now, that number is consistent with three, but there's still a little bit of wiggle room for it to be a little bit higher than three. And I know that's of a lot of interest. Um, I think we're going to hear from Joe Conlon on Thursday about um, whether that could be a signature of um, axion physics or other new components that could add even just a, a fraction of a, spe of a neutrino species. So that's, this is somewhere we're going to have incredible improvement in the next few years. We've already had incredible improvements, but we can shrink that even further, again, with polarization measurements of the CMB. We should be, we should, we're aiming at you know, going down to error bars of 0.1 and then below from future CMB measurements. And so if that number really is 3.3 .3 or 3.1, we'll start to get a, a hint of that. But so far, it's, it's highly consistent with 
um, no extra species. So those are kind of additional components that we could have in the universe. The primordial spectrum, um, I said we have now these, this, this twice the angular range we had before, and that allows us to probe the primordial spectrum um, uh, a lot better. One expects from simple single field inflation to have a few predictions, that the spectral index should be less than one, and that the running of the spectral index should be very small, tends to the minus uh, three or less. Again, from, um, from measuring those smaller scales, we can exclude strong, more negative runnings of the spectral index that used to be allowed. Um, first of all, I'm showing you the results from doubly map and act on the spectral index and the running, where this used to be the allowed region with quite a negative running allowed, and that's now shrunk down significantly to having only a running of about 1% allowed in the CMB. But the other big thing that uh, George mentioned as well is that then when you, add, when, you, when you switch to having Planck, this is the Planck result over here, I'm afraid now twisted by <laughs> the, the axes and are flipped. Um, the running is still very consistent with zero to one sigma, but now the index is measured to be less than one at very high significance. And that's a result that's, that's strongly present in the Planck data. Um, so we're getting down to 1% errors on the running. Um, there is this slight preference for a negative running, but it's at the one sigma level. And I don't say that that's, I wouldn't say that was uh, suggestive of new physics. Where we'd really like to get to is the running in, of the index that one would actually expect from inflation. But that's kind of beyond the scope of, of the CMB, although it shouldn't be necessarily beyond the scope of combined large-scale structure measurements, perhaps in 21 centimetre. There have been papers on, on how to get down to the, that, the level that we'd actually expect from inflation. Um, okay, and the last example I want to give from the primordial CMB are cosmic strings. So I said that one of the things that you can probe at small scales is fluctuations beyond just adiabatic fluctuations. Um, this is a bit of a busy plot, I realize, but I just want to remind people how that's done. So how we constrain, we, we know that cosmic strings cannot be the source, the primary source of fluctuations. They have completely the wrong power spectrum now measured from the CMB. But they do add, you could have a, a subdominant um, component of them and one can predict what that should look like with simulations. Now, the simulations are quite uncertain, um, but they, they at least give us a good sense of, of what the additional power could look like. So what I'm showing you here is the, again, an L to the fourth tipped up power spectrum to enhance the higher acoustic peaks. The magenta curve is the sort of standard adiabatic normal, normal fluctuations. And down here would be the additional power that one would expect from cosmic strings. And so how we do it is we simply can scale that additional power um, by a cosmic string tension and add it to the adiabatic fluctuations and see what you can have. And so, as you can imagine, by having new constraints at small scales, out of 2,000 to 3,000, where this string spe spectrum is still non-negligible, but the inflationary one is dying off, or the adiabatic one is dying off, the total in blue will start to exceed the, um, or start to be inconsistent with the data. Um, and that's what's given us now this current, this is this, the data on this plot is, is old, um, but with the current data, the string constraints are on at least one type of string model, NAMBU um, string simulations from Richard Batty, um, are less than 10 to the minus seven in the string tension. Um, and when you include that, we still find that, we, no, we now find that the spectral index of fluctuations is still less than one, even if you allow the cosmic string tension to vary. And that didn't used to be the case. There used to be this case where you could have some cosmic strings and a spectral index of one. And that could be consistent with hybrid inflation or models like that. Those are, that's gone now because you still, um, you, you, the spectral index is, is, is now preferred to be less than one. Okay, so the, we've
we're not seeing anything new, but we're constraining things a huge amount better than before. And I haven't, you know, I haven't gone through the other um, extensions to Lambda CDM. They're all tighter, and we're not seeing any new physics. Um, but these are also all things that will improve with um, polarization data. Okay, so I want to then um, move on to what we're learning from lensing of the CMB. So, as I said earlier, you've got lensing, the, the background CMB is lensed uh, by large scale structure. And this is a cartoon, uh, very cartoon diagram of how a CMB photon could be def gravitationally deflected by a large scale structure um, and hit us now. And we'll measure it, we'll measure the lensed temperature as being the unlensed temperature. Um, plus a deflection field. So every single photon that's coming to us is deflected by a very small amount due to large-scale structure. The deflection angle is of order a couple of arc minutes. And that explains why this is something that's now new and coming from small-scale CMB measurements. Um, you just couldn't see it uh, if you didn't have small-scale measurements. Um, we can write down, so we have, so, so what, so imagine you've got the CMB as a backlight, and you've now got everywhere on the sky a deflection field um, that you can think of as, so we'll write it down normally either as a deflection angle, so every pixel on the sky has an angle, um, or you can write down the angle as the gradient of some deflection field phi. So you have a, a field phi on the sky that says what your deflection, what your deflection is. Theoretically, that power spectrum, the power spectrum of the deflection angles, the two-point function of the deflection angle, um, is the, just the line of sight integral of a geometric term scaling the dark matter power spectrum. Um, this is just simple lensing physics, that uh, your CMB light is just gravitationally bent by every blob of dark matter or normal matter along its line of sight. So the physics of that... Um, is, is nice and simple. And crucially, you don't have any kind of bias terms in here because we're just talking about um, matter. We don't care what kind of matter it is. So the, the effect is small. You can't see it very well by eye. So here's a plot from Aurelian Benoit Levy on um, showing the lens and unlensed uh, CMB on a two and a half degree patch of the sky. And you can't really see very well the difference. But if we then switch this one between being lensed and unlensed, you can see there is a shift. Um, and what you're seeing is a very small shift, but a coherent shift, because the CMB is being deflected by coherent structures, um, because these are large-scale large structures, degree scale on the sky. So this coherent shift means you can actually look for, you can then try and, you can take these maps and unwrap them and, and figure out what was causing that deflection. Um, that's what's been done. So <coughs> this shows a, the compilation of the current CMB lensing measurements. The first measurement was by ACT in 2011, which is a four sigma measurement. And I'm showing you here just the updated measurement of that in, in red here. And so again, this is, this is the two point function of the lensing field against multipole L. Um, we reconstruct that lensing field by taking higher point statistics of the map. Roughly, it's, you'd get it by taking the temperature of the CMB map and the gradient of the temperature, and you find the two-point function of that. So the lensing potential is actually a four-point function, or the lensing potential power spectrum is a four-point function. Um, you can also see it in the power spectrum itself. It smears out the acoustic peaks. Lensing smears the peaks and adds small-scale power. But more information can be got if you can actually reconstruct the lensing potential itself. So um, the ACT data points are shown in red. Uh, then this was followed by um, SPT making a detection. These are shown in the yellow. And then the data points from Planck are shown um, here. So we went from four sigma to 25 sigma just in the last couple of years. So again, this is a fast moving field. Um, and as George already showed, this is, these are consistent with um, the Lambda CDM model that's shown on top of them. The neat thing, I think the neatest thing that we've been able to do first off with CMB lensing is to finally break the geometric degeneracy that's in the CMB um, internally. We've always had this case that you cannot distinguish or you can't um, disentangle varying geometries 
from uh, varying expansion rates of the universe in the CMB if you only have the primary signal. Um, you can always come up with models that look the same. You can have a model with no dark energy that's strongly curved, and it looks the same as lambda CBM in the primary CMB. And so we've always had to combine the CMB with other measurements to detect dark energy, for example, and to constrain late time physics. Um, that's now been finally broken, um, just internally to the CMB. And you can see why here. So up here, I'm showing you a plot of the deflection power spectrum. These are theory curves. The deflection power spectrum is a function of angular scale. Here is the lambda CBM model in blue. And in green is a model that is degenerate in the primary CMB, but looks completely different in the lensing. This is a model with no dark energy that's, a, that's geometrically curved. Um, and it just has twice as much lensing um, because you've got large scale structure at, at late times that's, that increases the amount of lensing you see. We use that with, in ACT to break this degeneracy between omega lambda. So we've got omega lambda and omega matter here. Um, previously, this model down here with no dark energy was allowed by the CMB. And with ACT lensing, we, we cut that off and made a detection of dark energy. This is now already significantly improved by going in the lensing from a four signal measurement to 25 signal measurement with Planck. And so now here's where we are with, with Planck, um, same omega lambda, omega matter, where that black contour is uh, what we now have from Planck, um, which is you know, highly, highly strongly saying we need dark energy. Now, you, you already get better, you get, right now, you get better information by adding the BAO measurements. And certainly, you do, you, if you want to understand dark energy at late time physics, you want to be combining measurements. But this just illustrates that the CMB lensing um, is already contributing significantly to um, understanding late time physics. <coughs> okay. What's next? So, at the moment, I would say that CMB lensing is improving constraints. So things like neutrino, we've heard that things like neutrino mass constraints um, are um, slightly improved or slightly modified with lensing. But it's not yet giving us new information about significant new physics information. But that's going to change in the next few years. So, I think, so CMB lensing is really um, taking off. Um, and how we're going to be doing that is through measuring small scale polarization. I've talked completely just about temperature so far. Um, but polarization is where things are going. We've already seen the results from George showing the Planck uh, pre-polarization results. We're going to hear more from uh, John about B modes. But what we're doing with small scale polarization is going after a couple of things. This, this, this curve up here shows you the, the temperature power spectrum. But what we're going to be measuring with um, ACTPOL, which is a um, new instrument, the upgrade to ACT, um, is the polarization power spectrum. And this is shown in green here, the E mode and the cross correlation in red. Um, in blue is the lensing power spectrum, B mode power spectrum that's generated from, from the E mode power spectrum. Um, and that's, since that's purely sourced by lensing, um, we're going to be able to get a better measurement of the CMB lensing through measuring polarization, mm -hmm. but at the same time, a measurement of the damping tail in polarization itself. OK, so at Pol, we're very excited because we had first light last month. Um, it's, it's much faster than, than, than ACT was and has polarization sensitivity with thousands of detectors. Um, the temperature sensitivity should be increased by about four times, as well as measuring polarization. Um, and we're going to be conducting both wide and deep surveys on the sky, covering deep patches of, you know, hundreds of, hundreds of hundred square degrees and also thousands of square degrees on a wider patch. We're going to be observing the sky on the equator, um, which has a huge amount of overlap with other wavelength data too, so that you can cross-correlate the lensing signal with um, optical and other wavelength data too. This is just an image of the the cryostat here before it was put into, into ACT. <coughs> the science we're after, again, it's, it's, two, it's two things. The first is to get the EMO damping tail. And the science we want to do with that, the kind of things I've been talking about already, um, probing the recombination physics. Um, 
But then the second thing is the, is the lensing. By, turn, by, by the fact that the E modes are lensed into B modes, by measuring the polarization, we have much better measurement of, of, of um, the lensing signal. And one of the most exciting things I think we can hope to do is constrain the sum of neutrino masses. With that poll, we should be getting into the sum of neutrino mass limits less than 0.2 EB regime. The forecasted limits, one sigma limits of 0.07 EB for ACPOL combined with Planck. So we can hope to quite soon get under that interesting regime where we can, for example, rule out or at least disfavor quasi-degenerate models where you've got quite a large minimum neutrino mass. Um, so, and that's a number that with ACPOL we hope to do um, to do excitingly well, but there are even going to be a next generation of instruments that can do even better with CMB lensing. Um, we'll also be looking to probe curvature and dark energy. Um, in particular, if there's anything strange going on at redshift two or three, CMB lensing is a really unique measurement um, constraint on that. This just illustrates a simulation done by Blake Sherwin of a deep act pole field where this, is, this would actually be the recovered lensing power spectrum um, on a small patch of the sky where that is going to be signal dominated. Those fluctuations will be the actual uh, lensing fluctuations um, showing you the dark matter field on the sky. Um, so that's coming soon. I should also, I want to, my final thing, I just want to advertise a new result that I've had nothing to do with, but I think is, is very cool, which is um, the first detection of B mode lensing from SPT pole. It's been on the sky for the last year or so. Um, this was put out in a paper by Duncan Hansen and the, and the SPT team just recently. Um, what they've measured is this is a map of the E mode polarization mapped by SPT pole. This is then a measurement of the lensing field actually reconstructed from the Herschel satellite. And using that, you can predict what the B mode polarization map should be given an E mode CMB map and a lensing map. Um, and that's shown over here. And they then cross correlated this predicted lensing map with their detected B mode signal um, and found they were highly correlated and thus made a detection of the B mode um, angular power spectrum in lensing. And that's shown here. So this is the power spectrum against angular scale. And these are detections of the, of the B mode. Um, so it's what we expect to see, but it's. Um, it's a really, it's a really neat, um, neat first result. Um, there's also polar bear experiment, which is taking data too. So we've got these three experiments um, measuring the CMB lensing. Um, and we should soon see more exciting results from them. OK, just to summarize, um, at small scales, the CMB is probing both recombination and CMB lensing. The temperature spectrum has now been measured by ACT, <laughs> SBT, and Planck to LF3000. I've shown that there's excellent consistency between the spectrum and the results we've got from ACT and WMAP versus um, from Planck. Um, CMB lensing really is fast growing. Um, and it's a field that's going to be, you're going to just see many, many more results from in the next few years. Um, in addition, we're going to get polarization measurements of the small scale CMB. Um, and we've seen these neat, this neat first detection of B modes from SPT poll. Um, cross correlations with other probes are going to be something that's going to be also done more and more, um, and there are really exciting prospects for neutrino physics. Thanks. Okay, thanks very much. Are there any questions? Uh, David Lies, can you get the... Well, just a comment about the running of the spectral index. You, you, you mentioned minus point zero zero one as the prediction of inflation. Um, I know that's not. It's not. It's I not mean that, that's very simple. that's only if the inflaton perturbation generates the curvature perturbation, and only in the simplest models. That's right. I'm sorry. I should have, I should have clarified that. That's so, absolutely right. Yeah. I mean, if it were if it were some other field like the curvature on C, then I would say the center of value is zero, but with a very wide spread, it could be anything really. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that, thank, thank, thanks for making that point. I think we should still try and measure it though. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mark? <laughs> um, 
with uh, polarization measurements, do you, uh, do you have the, the predicted sensitivity to go for BB, and in particular, cosmic stream BB? Yeah, so um, I don't have that forecasted number off the top of my head, but we will be getting the measurements. So um, we'll be measuring the B mode spectrum. With the, with the ground-based, so there's two, there's two kind of regimes of angular scales. There's a whole lot of lar very large-scale experiments that we're going to hear about from John. Um, and some of those will be useful for the cosmic string BB measurements. Um, with um, with ACPOL, we're going to be going small scale, and so we can look there as well. Um, but we'd be limited probably to L of a few hundred or, and greater with ACPOL um, due to our angular coverage. So um, I don't have the forecast off the top of my head, but yeah, it's, I, I think we're, we're, we're going to do better, and I should figure out what the number is. Okay. There's a question right up the back, maybe this will be the last one. Yeah, right uh, over there. Sorry. Thanks. John, could you start to set up if that's right? Um, I have a question about uh, cosmic strings that you mentioned. Yeah. Um, naively, one would think because cosmic strings tends to add small-scale power to the total power, yeah. um, that if you allow for it, the spectral index for the adiabatic modes would be driven redder, not bluer which seems opposite of what uh, you mentioned in the talk. I wonder, can you explain? Well, let's see. Um, so, let's see. Yeah, the spectrum used to be tipped up steeper mm, with additional cosmic strings. Let's just think. I can see, yeah, if you just add small scale power, I can see that you would want to compensate for that with a more, with a smaller spectral index. But I think that that was also coming for, so I wasn't quite, because I was showing an L to the four plot, if I showed a L squared plot, there's actually a strong P, it goes up and then down, right? So it's actually the up, it's the up that used to do it, and now it's the fact that you've also got small scale power that's also constraining it. So it's that peak that, that's, that's changing it. It's not just a straight increasing. Okay, well, we'd better finish there. Let's thank our speaker again. Okay. Okay. Well, so it's a great pleasure to have John Kovac from Harvard University, and he's going to tell us about B modes from the ground. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, this talk's going to be a change of pace. This is going to be a very much uh, uh, an experimental focused talk, focusing on the, the challenges and prospects for measuring R using ground-based telescopes. So this is, these are now the, uh, the L of 100 B modes that uh, Joe was talking about, the smaller angular scales. And it's, uh, it's a particular pleasure to be here in this venue because uh, Eleven years ago, uh, at Cosmo 2002, uh, an experiment dear to my heart, this is my thesis experiment actually, uh, first detected the polarization of the CMB and announced at, uh, at, at this conference uh, that detection. And uh, there's the map that was made, and a lot of the same features that identify um, uh, this work, this survey, actually uh, apply to the experimental challenges that are now being faced by the current generation of telescopes. So this, uh, this map was produced on a very limited patch of the sky. It's about three by three degrees. And the E-mode polarization that was measured has an RMS of about uh, three microkelvin on that field. And it was measured with high signal noise, actually a signal noise uh, peaking at three on uh, scales of about half a degree in that map. And that was uh, an initial detection. It was big news. We were very happy. Um, so now B modes from the ground. Uh, so even when we made that initial detection, uh, theoretically it was a bit of a yawn. The E mode polarization looked exactly like the theory predicted it to be. And uh, everyone was oriented already from the start towards the prospects of uncovering new physics in the B mode polarization of the CNB. And we knew that we had a long way to go. 
So B modes from the ground, what are the, the features of the experiments uh, that are going after this, uh, this from the ground that, that are in common? Well, uh, ground-based experiments can achieve deep concentrated coverage, unlike a satellite where you tend to cover the whole sky. Uh, and that means that uh, your primary strategy on foregrounds is avoidance. Uh, you're also limited in your frequency coverage when you're on the ground uh, to two or three bands where you can get good sensitivity, uh, four at most. And so you use the limited frequencies, but uh, picking the cleanest patches of sky. Uh, systematic control with repeated in situ calibrations. Uh, you can access your telescope. You can make very precise measurements of it in the field while it's observing. Uh, large detector count and a rapid technology cycle. So when you have your telescope on the ground, you can go every year. You can update it with the latest focal plane technology. Uh, and so uh, experiments on the ground have seen this very rapid turnover in their sensitivity uh, from year to year. Uh, and relentless observing. So when you're concentrating all your coverage on a small patch of sky with a large number of detectors, you're scanning that patch sometimes multiple times per day. This yields many, many redundancies in the surveys that you accumulate. And so there are a large number of consistency tests that can be formed with these data sets. So all of this, uh, in my opinion, uh, gives us a powerful recipe that's optimized for uh, high confidence initial discovery. So it's definitely not the best for doing comprehensive cosmology, but for targeted science, uh, these ground-based surveys are excellent, and particularly for this application of going after R, uh, I think uh, ground-based surveys will find a niche here. So, um, so how have we done in the last 11 years? Um, well, uh, I said we had a long way to go, and it's true the E-mode polarization spectrum has now been measured by many experiments to relatively high precision. Uh, you can see it's nothing like the precision of the temperature spectrum measurements now, but uh, we're eagerly awaiting the Planck data and the new generation of polarization experiments that are going to have order uh, 1,000 detectors uh, from the ground are going to add a lot to this E temperature spectrum measurement. B polarization, uh, the direct BB auto spectra measurements are still only upper limits. Uh, and that remains uh, true now. So the, uh, um, uh, the best upper limits here are provided by uh, BICEP and at the smaller angular scales, the quad experiments. Uh, there are some other experiments here providing competitive upper limits from uh, Atacama, the quiet experiment. Uh, but still uh, seemingly a long way away from this goal of detecting the, uh, the, the tensor bump at uh, L of 50 to 100 here uh, in the B modes. Uh, that line is shown for R of 0.1, which is the maximum signal compatible with uh, the current Planck data. Uh, and so the, uh, the previous generation telescopes still have quite a ways to go. That benchmark there is 100 nanokelvin that they can aim for. Uh, it's a very faint signal. OK, but uh, progress is being made rapidly. And Joe showed this, uh, uh, this detection beautifully. So I don't have to say very much about how SPT uh, used an external data set, uh, uh, mapping out the lensing potential, and used that in combination with their E-mode polarization measurements to predict the form of the B-mode signal in their data. And then in a cross-spectrum analysis, which, as we all know, is easier and uh, cleaner with respect to systematics than doing an auto-spectrum analysis with your data. So when you can use an external data set to predict the form of the signal and the modes you're looking for, it gives you uh, a great way to do a simple analysis. And SBT beautifully pulled out the predicted B-mode lensing spectrum. And this came out just last month. So that's really encouraging. Uh, we can expect a lot more. Uh, from these polarization experiments on the smaller angular scales now that they've scaled up to this huge number of detectors count. So let's see. Uh, to show you where some of these ground-based telescopes actually operate, uh, many of them are at the South Pole. Uh, it's a nice place to be a CMB telescope. You get to live in a, a beautiful observatory building here. Not shown on the bottom part of this figure here is uh, because the photo is being taken from the main station are the facilities where you, uh, you eat and you work. Uh, so it's a convenient place to work. You can see the transportations provided. And the scale of the experiments here is very impressive. This is the 10-meter South Pole Telescope. And the uh, uh, BICEP-1, BICEP-2, BICEP-3, and Keck Ray experiments that I'm going to be talking more about 
really targeting this degree scale polarization. Uh, Atacama CMB telescopes. Uh, this photo is probably a couple of years old, but uh, ACTPOL and ABS are operating uh, here on this site, and Polar Bear has just set up shop there. I can zoom in and see what that neighborhood looks like. So you can see also a very large scale of operations set up there in Chile. Okay, so to, uh, to hit a few of those points uh, on common features of uh, ground-based CMB uh, B-mode searches. So galactic foreground avoidance. Um, so you, you wanna go where the foregrounds aren't, obviously. And uh, this was the picture when we first chose our observing field uh, um, in the middle of the last decade using the best information, which at that time on synchrotron polarized foregrounds was coming from the WMAP uh, polarization. Uh, and uh, we could use that to predict the, uh, the low frequency end of the polarized foregrounds here. And at uh, the high frequency end, the dust polarization. Uh, so here, uh, just a very simplistic model, uh, taking an FDS unpolarized dust model and multiplying it by a 5% polarization fraction at high galactic latitudes gives predictions that look like this. You can see there's a lot more contrast in the dust than there is in the radio emission at high galactic latitudes. And that pushes you up to higher frequencies, somewhere between 100 and 150 gigahertz as the sweet spot if you're gonna pick the cleanest region of sky to do your work. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that's what we and many other experiments now have done, is to uh, pick a region like this, the southern hole where you concentrate most of your observing time. That red box is 2% of the sky. Okay, uh, so I touched on systematics, and I'm going to talk more about it in some detail in this talk, but uh, just to frame the challenge here um, of one kind of systematic, one that we spend a lot of time worrying about, that is the leakage into the polarization signal of your experiment of much brighter unpolarized temperature signals here. Okay, so uh, let's start with the goal here. The typical degree scale brightness fluctuations at 150 gigahertz, if we hope to measure B modes at R of 0.01, those are 30 nanokelvin signals. Okay, so the lensing B modes, which are not at degree scales, they're at arc minute scales, are 10 times brighter at 300 nanokelvin. The CMB primary temperature anisotropies, which of course are all over the sky, you can't get away from them, so even if you pick the cleanest region and you have perfect shielding, they will be in your field of view, are a thousand times brighter. And so you have to have exquisite control of your experiment to be able to reject the temperature signal and measure polarization at that level. Outside your field, hopefully, is the galaxy and typical brightness fluctuations there. Uh, at 150 gigahertz might range from a few tenths to 30 millikelvin. So here now we're talking 10 to the 4, 10 to the 6 times the science target. So you have to have excellent side lobe control onto the galaxy. And the atmosphere and the ground will contribute brightness fluctuations on these degree scales that can range from tens of millikelvin up to kelvin, depending on which way you're cutting across the atmosphere. And the ground, of course, in the worst case scenario, uh, you can measure gradients of up to 300 Kelvin. Uh, so this is quite daunting, and I was, uh, I was encouraged by uh, the speaker yesterday who, uh, I, I hope I got the quote right, uh, he mentioned um, uh, with respect to direct dark matter searches, the backgrounds are horrible, but people are brave. So I, uh, uh, I hope we are. Uh, we've taken on the challenge anyway. Okay, so I'm gonna talk uh, in some detail about this particular experimental program, uh, the BICEP and Kekere series of telescopes, uh, because uh, we're in the field, we've got quite a lot of data, we're, uh, we're a little bit ahead at this stage, but there are many other experiments that are now taking data and operating, and I think that the experience that we have is gonna be uh, somewhat illustrative of the results that you can expect to see in the next year or two from all of these, uh, these groups. Uh, so starting with uh, the BICEP-1 generation, uh, and you see the timeline up here, 2006 to 2008. Okay, so team BICEP uh, was a relatively small team. These experiments have all scaled up to some extent, but this shows uh, us with this small BICEP telescope before we shipped uh, from Caltech at that time uh, with Andrew Lang as our PI. Um, and so uh, why use such a small aperture? 
for your CMB telescope, obviously you're giving up information on the, uh, the arc minute scales where there's a lot of cosmology be, uh, to be done with the polarization. Uh, well, uh, uh, for a targeted experiment, a small aperture is very efficient to integrate, to test, and to deploy, as you can see here. Uh, and it also means that you can put the entire telescope in the cryostat. And so your telescope can be at 4 Kelvin. You get great stability of the telescope and the beams. Your aperture being small can be completely filled with calibrators. Your far field is not very distant. You, you can access it experimentally very easily and very directly with no re-imaging optics or anything else. Uh, you simply put a, a source 200 meters away and you're comfortably in the far field with a telescope like this. Um, and so you can do very precise beam maps uh, easily. Uh, a small aperture allows you to uh, rotate the entire instrument. So you can have a mount that has a third axis of rotation, which is impractical if you've got a six or a 10 meter telescope. Uh, and so that gives you a lot of systematic control when you're uh, designing a polarization experiment. Uh, and a small aperture allows you to uh, achieve superior side lobe suppression, of course. Okay, so I can't resist showing you a little bit about what it looks like to work at the South Pole. Uh, compared to sighting a 10 meter telescope there, which happened the next year, uh, uh, this lift was pretty easy for the guys down there at South Pole. They just picked up our little telescope with their crane. We cut a hole in the roof and they dropped it through the DSL observatory. Here's the inside of the observatory and putting the instrument together. So this is the BICEP-1 receiver, and you can see this forest of uh, feed horns here up on top uh, of the receiver. Behi behind each one of those feed horns is a PSB pair that's very much like the polarization-sensitive detectors on the Planck satellite, except BICEP has uh, of order 100 of these detectors, uh, as opposed to the few dozen that are flying on Planck. Uh, so this is the sub-Kelvin refrigerator. The 4 Kelvin telescope tube goes on top of that, and the entire thing goes into a liquid helium cryostat. That helium cryostat, in turn, mounts uh, onto this telescope mount, which pokes up through that hole in the roof uh, and forms a nice, convenient observatory. So almost immediately, we got to work uh, uh, characterizing the instrument, its polarization uh, response and its beams. And we've been doing that nonstop ever since, with every season refining our procedures. Uh, so what I'm showing here is, uh, is actually uh, uh, several generations in calibration measurements, now with BICEP-2, uh, precision beam mapping uh, on site. We've got a uh, precise flat mirror that redirects the beam of the telescope over the rim of our ground shield towards uh, a source that's on a mast over here that allows us to uh, form precise beam maps on unpolarized sources and we can put a rotating polarized source up there with known orientation, and we can measure the response to a polarized source, getting the polarization efficiency and angle very precisely in the far field beam. So you can see the response to an unpolarized source when we difference two oppositely polarized detectors, vertical and horizontal polarized, as we would for making a polarization measurement on the sky. It doesn't look that hot, and that's actually true for bicep two's beams. There is a significant amount of pointing mismatch between two coincident detectors in a pixel pair, two arc minutes, uh, which is a decent fraction of the beam size, 30 arc minutes. Uh, and so that's something that we account for in the analysis uh, we have excellent knowledge of, and I'll talk a little bit more about that coming up. But that's one of our uh, large experimental challenges. So aside from just that main beam mismatch, it's important uh, to map uh, the entire beam response so the, the uh, uh, that ratio between the temperature anisotropies and the polarization signal that we're after of 10 to the 3 uh, sets a scale for how well you need to understand all of the integrated power in your beam. You can't tolerate missing solid angle at that level of 10 to the 3. And so we have worked very hard to form uh, beam maps that are precise on a detector by detector basis. Uh, here you see a number of single maps taken at different instrument orientations, all of them composited after cross-checking for their consistency into this map here, and four orders of magnitude in the depth. You can see the main beam here. You can see uh, the first airy ring of that and some asymmetry in that, which is very interesting. You can also see a crosstalk beam here that's at the uh, uh, three or four tenths of a percent level. And that's also something that needs to be accounted for in analysis like this. But we measure it precisely, and this is a systematic that we understand quite well. Uh, the crosstalk comes from. Uh, our squid multiplexing system. 
All right, so just more on precision beam mapping here. You can see uh, now taking a radio profile and integrating, you can see the first, second, third, fourth, fifth area ring, high precision uh, in this data. Uh, in profile, uh, the data is here. The blue is a physical optics model. You can see they don't agree precisely, and you can also see there are significant differences between the two polarizations. All of this is something that you care deeply about if you're trying to measure signals at 30 nanokelvin. Side lobe characterization. Now, far side lobes, we can, uh, with our small aperture, very easily, uh, when we get our graduate students out of it, uh, mount a, uh, a blackened baffle on the front of our telescope uh, that can intercept all of the, the far side lobe power very effectively. You can put our, your telescope in an absorbing microwave bucket. Uh, so a small refractor uh, gives you an unobstructed aperture, allows you to use that black four baffle, uh, relatively small reflective ground shield. Uh, the combination of those things gives us a uh, response with the four baffle at angles that are outside our main field of view, 30 degrees away at uh, the minus 40 dBi level, or if you'd like, uh, nine orders of magnitude from the main beam peak response. Okay, so uh, some sky coverage uh, with BICEP-1. Uh, we spend most of our time observing this clean southern hole region. We spend a small fraction on the galaxy. You can see that drifting past in this wonderful movie made by Cynthia Chang. Uh, in the three years that BICEP-1 observed, we collected over 10,000 hours on our CMB target field. So that is comparatively good observing efficiency of the 25-odd thousand hours that we might have had in those three calendar years. 10,000 of them were actually spent on our CMB target. Uh, for a ground-based experiment, that's excellent. Obviously, for a satellite, you do much, much better. Um, E modes and B modes published to date. Okay, so here, uh, here are those uh, E spectra again, and now highlighting the published results from the BICEP 1 telescope. These limits here on the B spectrum uh, place a limit on R at the 0.72 level, 95% confidence. And that came out in 2010. Since then, we've been working on fielding new telescopes, but we've also updated the BICEP 1 analysis. Uh, to include more data, the third year of observations, and we introduced additional channels. We've spent a lot of time getting our statistics polished and just right. So 52% more data, uh, better noise modeling, uh, better likelihood estimation, uh, better control of systematics developed in one sense in particular. So this is a deep projection of a certain kinds of temperature polarization leakage come from main beam mismatch, where we take our main beam and we tailor expand it up to second order here. Uh, so this is the main beam response to a temperature signal, and if you have a pointing mismatch, it's a combination of these first two terms, the first derivatives. If you have a beam size mismatch between your two polarized detectors, it looks like this, and if you have differential ellipticity, it's these combinations of the second derivatives. So if you have a precise map of the temperature sky, which WMAP and now Planck have given us, you can take these modes and you can form a template for the potentially contaminated modes in your time stream data, and that's precisely what we do, detector by detector. And we deproject those modes. We actually just identify those modes and we set them to zero. It's equivalent to uh, marginalizing over them, or if you'd like, to fitting and subtracting. It's different from saying that we're going to measure the mismatch precisely enough to correct for those modes and subtract it off and recover the information from uh, those modes in the data. Uh, but it turns out we could do either because we have very precise measurements of our beam mismatch. Okay, so uh, for the BICEP-1 three-year analysis, we applied that deep projection technique just to the uh, dominant systematic uncertainty at the level of the BICEP-1 sensitivity. That was the relative gain uncertainty, so just the first of these modes here, this one, uh, between the two detectors in every pair. Uh, so we believe that we had characterized those and it was producing a maximum false equivalent R signal at the 0.15 level. And so by deep projecting that mode out of our data, we've eliminated that potential systematic. But more importantly, we've developed this procedure for use in our future experiments. Okay, so the BICEP three-year uh, polarization maps now uh, displayed as E-mode maps and B-mode maps are shown here on the left. The E-mode map obviously has more signal than the B-mode map. The B-mode map is consistent with simulations of pure noise. 
So I mentioned uh, null tests. Here is one, the so-called deck orientation null test, where you take the telescope when it's been pointing in certain orientations and when it's uh, rotated around the bore site to a complementary set of rotations, and you subtract off uh, the signal, the cosmological signal, and you're left with something that uh, should be consistent with noise and with any systematics that have been thrown into relief by that subtraction process. It's a powerful null test. Uh, it's one of uh, uh, seven or eight null tests that we rely on for the BICEP-1 analysis, and it confirms that uh, the map noise is integrating down. In the case of the 150 gigahertz BICEP three-year data, we're at this level of 500 nanokelvin in square degree pixels. And how far does that get us on the B spectrum? Uh, well, here's the E spectrum, uh, measured with high signal to noise, and the B spectrum is shown in black. And here, again, the B spectrum blown up with uh, uh, the two-year result and the three-year result uh, showing very good consistency. We actually uh, wound up with a relatively unlucky draw, adding in another year's worth of data. The result did not improve by that much. The upper limit on R is at the point 7-0 level now at 95% confidence, and R is 0 0.06, plus or minus around 0.25. And it's just a little bit above the median from SIMS, but very consistent with uh, uh, the simulated universe here in which R equals zero. Okay, so the initial uh, results that we and, uh, and the rest of the field got back from BICEP-1 is, is that uh, there's a green light. This is essentially doable. Uh, it is possible to make a high signal noise measurement of the CMB polarization at L of 100 and do, to do that from the ground. The instrument worked as designed, uh, and systematics seem controllable, we believe, all the way down to R of 0.01. So we were encouraged by this. Many other people were encouraged by this and uh, built slightly different experiments as follow-ons to this. Also, this is hard. Three years of data have yielded a result that still is not anywhere close to touching the indirect limits that are being produced on R by Planck. At R of 0.07, we obviously need a lot more sensitivity if we want to push into that interesting regime of R of 0.1 and below. So more sensitivity is exactly what, uh, uh, what the field is all about right now. Uh, so BICEP2 and the Keck array are shown here. And uh, in these cartoons on the bottom, you see how the detector count has increased from the BICEP1 focal plane to BICEP2 and the Keck array. So let me see, I can uh, show this in more detail. All the current generation experiments now use mass-produced superconducting detector arrays uh, in their focal planes. Uh, so this is our focal plane. Here is a silicon tile uh, blown up. It is an array of uh, 64 pairs of polarization-sensitive detectors. In this case, they're formed by uh, arrays of slot antennas. Uh, you saw SPT poles uh, horn-fed array but again, monolithic wafers uh, form the detectors behind that horn array. Uh, these slot antennas, uh, the ver vertical and horizontal slots, are feeding a pair of detectors associated with each pixel, and those detectors are transition edge superconducting bolometers. Uh, and here they are, operating at around uh, 250 millikelvin. Uh, so, uh, I talked about the rapid development cycle uh, with these experiments, and uh, BICEP-2's uh, focal plane was deployed to South Pole only in January 2010 for first light later that month, and observations starting that February. We actually constructed a clean room at South Pole for this, and SPT uses that same clean room, and every year we upgrade our focal planes down there on site, and other groups do the same now. So that's part of what is fueling the rapid advances in sensitivity with all the experiments operating in the field. So the Keck array, what is that? Well, it's essentially five bicep twos. Um, so rather than uh, using liquid helium, which is uh, difficult to supply in quantity at South Pole, we switched to pulse tube coolers now, and we've made a compact version of this cryostat. We could fit five of them into the old daisy mount. Uh, and this gives us a total of 2,500 detectors on the sky right now. Okay, so I'm actually gonna show you a little raw data not going to apologize for this. This is uh, uh, an hour's worth of data from our telescope, 500 detectors, uh, time streams over plotted, and you can see the mount motion is up here on the top. This is uh, time running this way, and we start and end each hour with a little 
elevation knot, a mini sky dip that excites all of the detectors on the gradient of the atmosphere. This is relatively good weather, and the atmospheric signal in the detectors looks very clean. The detectors that are higher in the focal plane respond less than the detectors that are lower because their air mass is being modulated less. Otherwise, they look exactly the same. So this is the pair sum, or the temperature data. If you take two detectors that are in a pair and you add them together, and if you difference them, you get the polarization signal here. You can see in this weather, the pair sum looks only slightly noisier than the pair difference. The uh, weather gets a little bit worse, and you start to pick up tens of millikelvin structure across the atmosphere as you're scanning back and forth, but you see at that level, the atmosphere is largely unpolarized. And so this is the data that we typically process. We have three years of that data with BICEP2 in the can right now. So 17,000 scan sets, which is what I just showed you, approximately an hour's worth of data, now under analysis from BICEP2 from those three years. 18 terabytes of data. And uh, there's a lot of uh, sophisticated um, pipeline coding machinery that goes with processing this volume of data. So I've got to call out Clem Prike, who's responsible uh, for overseeing uh, our efforts and our team on this coding effort um, and uh, produce some of the plots on the next slides. Okay, so cumulative weights of BICEP2, you can see that the, uh, uh, the weight, that is the variance, the noise in the data, or the inverse variance, I should say, has increased steadily as we got better at tuning up the detectors through the course of these three years. We had an opportunity to do that because we've got uh, an experiment that you can poke at. Uh, and, and continue to optimize. And so the, uh, you can see the last year uh, of observing acquired almost half of the weight, the total weight of the three seasons. And BICEP2's three-year maps look like this. So now the Q and the U uh, Stokes parameters on the sky are reflecting primarily, you see this, this grid-like pattern here that's vertical and horizontal in Q. That's the E-mode structure in the sky. Uh, bleeding through into Q and coming in again at plus or minus 45 degrees in the U maps. So BICEP2 has a, achieved a sensitivity of around 120 nanokelvin in degree pixels. So in Keck, in its first year operating with five receivers, didn't quite equal that, 170 nanokelvin. In its second year operating right now, uh, it's now surpassed this. So together, uh, two seasons of Keck have, uh, uh, have just acquired uh, below 100 nanokelvin in uh, degree pixels sensitivity on the sky, which is quite a milestone. But we're focused right now on the analysis of the BICEP2 maps. Okay, so how do we analyze those maps? Well, uh, in a nutshell, you take their Fourier transform and then you square. Uh, and if you've been up uh, in annular bins, you can see now that these axes, both of them, are uh, red in L. So the annular bins here are the angular power spectra, except we've got Fourier transforms of the Q map and the U map. You can see missing along the vertical axis are some modes that have been filtered out by our scan strategy. Uh, so you can take these Q maps and U maps and uh, locally transform them in the Fourier planes, very simple to do, into E and B. And if you rotate them into E, you get something that looks like this. Okay, so this is the E mode power spectrum in 2D. Uh, directly read from our map. You can see the first peak here in these annuli around L of uh, 100, L of 120, and the second peak here in annuli that are out around L of 300. Uh, so we just bin up uh, around these annuli uh, to form our power spectra. Uh, null tests that we perform, well, it's a, a, a very simple illustration, of course, is if you bin up the first half and the second half of your data and you subtract. Uh, and it looks gratifyingly clean on the same color scale. Of course, we do a much more rigorous test than that, but I wanted to show you that uh, you can construct systematics tests uh, that throw certain instrumental effects into stark relief. And so if we perform a, a DEC null test, again, rotating instrumental uh, orientation and forming a difference, we can get it to fail quite easily. And the reason is that this data set has a large degree of this kind of uh, mismatch between the beams. So this null test differences subsets in the map that maximize the non-cancellation of the dipole form of the temperature to polarization leakage. Uh, however, deep projection can remove this very easily. And so we, we deep project all of these modes 
and the net result is that it cleans up. In fact, it winds up being quite consistent with signal plus noise simulations after that process. We perform this deep projection on every detector pair at the time stream level, and we allow the coefficients to vary with time, although we probably don't have to. Okay, simulations. So uh, we do full time stream simulations, and that's the, the, uh, the basis of our analysis. All of the E to B mixing effects are included uh, in those simulations, whether from map projection, sky cut, filtering, the deep projection operations, and the E to B mixing is debiased using those sims. We find that using heuristic pure B estimators, uh, like those invented by Kendrick Smith in 2007, is a useful uh, estimator for us uh, for B, for eliminating the variance from cut sky induced E to B mixing. Uh, so that certainly helps a bit, works well down to R0.05. We've got improved estimators that are under development to reduce that E to B mixing and take us down to uh, lower levels of R without suffering a penalty from the E power that's being leaked into B. But we can remove that, we can predict that very precisely and remove, remove the bias in our data set. The systematics are being extensively probed. We've got uh, uh, of order 14 now of the most useful combinations of null tests. All of those must pass. We also do extensive forward simulations using each measured systematic, including now the full beam model that I, I showed you some of on previous slides. That allows us to characterize what level the undeprojected residual temperature polarization leakage is in these data sets in detail. Okay, so now I'm going to show you, uh, this is not real data, these are simulations, but this is an output of simulated signal and noise B modes uh, from lambda CDM uh, and R equals zero in this simulation. So this is a simulation derived from the bicep two level of noise, and I'm going to add in R of 0.1. So in principle, that is the level of sensitivity that our experiment is at right now. Uh, and we're working very hard on this analysis, as you can imagine. Okay, so uh, I will show you the real data's E-mode map here and its B-mode map. And the name of the game is, uh, what is this map consistent with? Okay, so the race for R, uh, it may seem like this has been a long time coming, 11 years. But progress has actually been much faster than it was expected. So the CMB task force report, uh, for example, which came out shortly after polarization was initially detected, uh, charted a course for measuring R that had us reaching these levels of uh, 100 nanokelvin in degree pixels sometime around 2017. And that's what we've just achieved in those maps that I showed you. Uh, so uh, we're going well. It's driven largely by the development of these very large format focal plane arrays and the rapid deployment of those into the field by us and by many other groups. And uh, some of those other groups I should mention now. Uh, so uh, BICEP2 and KEK array, I already, uh, so starting with the small aperture experiments and working towards the large aperture experiments, small aperture experiments here being optimized really for these degree scale B modes. BICEP2 and the KEK array, of order uh, 500 detectors and 2,500 detectors. ABS, which has been taking data in Chile, has uh, uh, 480. EBEX uh, balloon, which flew last year from Antarctica with 1,200 detectors. The Polar Bear Telescope, uh, operating from Chile, 1,200 detectors this last year. AXPOL just came online last month with, I believe, 1,000 detectors initially, working up to 3,000. And SPT Pole, 1,500 detectors since last year. Coming in 2014, uh, SPIDER, another balloon. Uh, BICEP3 will add another 2,500 detectors at the South Pole. And then uh, beyond that, uh, probably in 2015 or 2016, we have another balloon, PIPER. And upgrades to SPT, Polar Bear, and ACTPOL are all planned with over 10,000 detectors now. So that is where the field is going. The scale up has already happened to class 1,000 uh, detector experiments. And we can expect results from multiple groups with uh, complementary systematics and, and, in many cases, overlapping coverage. So we put together this plot showing experimental progress where the raw aggregated experimental sensitivity now is shown here as a function of year for some representative experiments. You see the Planck satellite, the current generation of ground-based telescopes, had equaled Planck in sensitivity, but we're concentrating it on a very small patch of sky. These are the class 10,000 generation uh, of experiments, class 10,000 detector generation of experiments uh, that are going to be operating uh, in the coming couple of years. Uh, 
and then uh, what we've been calling stage four, CMBS4, class 100,000 detectors is shown here. And this is something where uh, the CMB community uh, has tried to organize and, and reach a consensus on what we think is achievable if we work together uh, for what happens next after the stage three class 10,000 uh, detector experiments. Uh, from the ground with 100,000 to maybe even as many as 500,000 detectors on multiple platforms spread across multiple sites. Uh, so that is the CMBS4 experiment as it's been spec'd. Um, so I'll get back to that in one slide. Uh, B modes from the ground, okay, so I've, I've uh, already run through this bullet list and uh, hopefully I've convinced you how these pertain to our experiment. I think that they are general features that we can expect. Uh, how deep can we go on R? So I think that we can hope that the current generation class 10,000 experiments can push down to this regime R of 0.01 in the next several years. We hope to get there by the 2015-2016 uh, 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 timescale. And then uh, going further than that uh, will require pushing even on the best 1% of the sky deep into the foregrounds, both the galactic foregrounds here these lines now come from the Planck Sky Model. Uh, and of course, we'll have more information on those foregrounds shortly. And uh, deep into the lensing signal by applying a de-lensing, that is measuring the lensing potential using the information out here and undoing the lensing on the uh, degree scale B modes here to dig down in both cases by a factor of five to 10 in map space to reach this level of R of 0.001 for a one sigma sensitivity on R. It's going to be a tall order, but uh, the consensus of experimentalists in the, uh, the field in the US, at least this summer, was that we think that we can spec such an experiment, and we're excited about working towards it. Pushing below this R of 0.01 threshold, of course, uh, takes us past the boundary between large field and small field models of inflation. And uh, we heard uh, um, yesterday about uh, the... Uh, um, Starobinsky effective potential here at R of 0.003 or so, and think that that is probably in reach with the CMBS4 experiment from the ground in the next decade. Uh, so these different lines here are projecting different sensitivities for different scenarios of how deep we can go in the foreground removal and what degree of delensing we can benefit uh, from uh, using different uh, size apertures, uh, different resolution on the CMB lensing signal. And uh, all of these scenarios can achieve less than R of 0 0.001, one sigma uncertainty on R. So that's the end of my talk. I just want to convince you that uh, there are a lot of experiments taking data right now, including ours, and the next year will be exciting uh, with the results we can expect to see from this generation of experiments. I expect that Planck will have something to say about this plot in the coming year, and uh, I think that many ground-based experiments will as well, so watch this space. Thanks very much for a, f a fascinating overview of the future of tensor mode. Um, one quick question. Yeah. Hi, um, just a comment about your um, two, two slides before. Uh, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Um, the one after this. This one. Yeah, so, um, just a comment that you don't really require l large field values to get large uh, tensor to scalar ratio. In principle, you can get roughly up 0 0.1 even with so delta phi can be okay just just a comment all right um just just before we um, go to tea uh, which is a bit late i apologize for letting george go on for so long um, <laughs> Um, just remember that if you're giving a parallel session this afternoon, make sure you put your talk on a memory stick at the registration desk. And remember, there are two directions for getting coffee, okay? Left or right. Uh, go the line of least resistance. So let's thank our speaker again.
Okay, uh, I think uh, I think we'd better make a belated start. If I can have your attention. Okay, I think we should start. Okay, it's a, it's a pleasure to uh, welcome another member of the Planck team now, uh, Ben Vondalt, who's uh, from the IAP in Paris, and he's going to tell us about fundamental physics from cosmology, Planck and beyond. Thank you, Paul. Thank you for the kind invitation to come speak here in Cambridge. <clears throat> so, the slide, of course, summarizes the contributions from uh, from all the team members to uh, to the mission. Um, and this is my title. So, we've already heard this morning um, about Planck results, and, and in some ways, uh, we've been looking ahead at what's to come. Uh, both from B modes and from uh, just small scale observations. Um, and so, what I've been talking about is a little bit complementary, looking at uh, just certain aspects. There'll be a little bit of overlap, maybe, but um, mostly uh, I'll be talking about ways we can use Planck to learn about fundamental physics in the early universe and also in the late universe. So, just to remind ourselves why, what, what's going on, uh, what is the source of information? Um, so the big picture is that we're trying to learn all these things from uh, modes. So the number of modes is important. Um, and uh, this is what you heard about uh, essentially from Joe, that uh, you know, when you go to small scales, we massively increase the number of modes. Even if you just look at a small part of the sky, we get, uh, we get many modes as long as we can take care of uh, foreground effects and systematics. Um, but this just shows the big picture where these, these, this map shows, the Planck map shows the largest modes that we have access to observationally. And then uh, there's this huge range of scales um, that we can go, go down in. And uh, if we try to be even more um, inclusive, these, this just shows two kinds of probes of, um, of the perturbation modes, early perturbation modes, um, CMB and large scale structure. But actually, um, ultimately, we would like to uh, go and observe uh, all these various probes of, um, of physics. And really what we're trying to do is to uh, match this cosmic history here um, in terms of physics uh, with uh, and probe all of these steps that are tied together in the Big Bang model um, and match them against all these uh, um, observables. And I think during this week, we'll hear a lot about uh, um, Several of these, today we're focusing on the cosmic microwave background. Um, and we're trying to use all of this information from large scale structure, 21 centimeter absorption, um, CMB spectral distortions, the neutrino background, if we can ever measure it directly, um, gravitational waves, um, trying to use all this information to tie together what we know um, and answer this list of modest questions, which is really what's driving all of us, what's banged at the Big Bang. Um, how did structure appear in the universe? How did it evolve until today? How do we piece together the entire history? Uh, what is it, what's the universe made of? What are the properties of all this stuff? Uh, dark matter, dark energy, still a complete mystery. Um, and uh, what are the, what's the geometry and what are the symmetry properties of the, of the universe? So um, these kinds of questions we're trying to address with large surveys. Um, Planck, of course, uh, is one of them, but there's the next generation of large-scale structure surveys that are coming up that will have a lot to say about these questions. Um, and we'll hear more about that in the days to come. So uh, from this perspective, the Planck, CMB, the Planck map really is a, a view of the primordial vacuum fluctuations, which is quite amazing that we're able to do that. And um, what I would be talking about is to use this to learn about uh, possible field content at the um, at the time when these fluctuations were imprinted. So let's, let's think about how we can do this. Um, how do these observations relate to what we want to know? Um, just a data set isn't really very informative. Um, you always need to confront it with theory. And in fact, you can go one step further. And there's this nice quote uh, that you shouldn't believe any observational result until it is confirmed by theory. And, 
<laughs> but it has a it has a very nice Bayesian ring to it, actually. Um, um, so, if you're talking about scalar perturbations, um, adiabatic scalar perturbations, then really this is all you need to know. This and one extra ingredient, which I'll mention, uh, mention in a minute. And this is the a curvature perturbation on the light cone. So this is, this is the 3D object that we're trying to constrain using all of these various observations. Um, and uh, essentially, it's a, it's a view of the quantum perturbations imprinted on the metric. Um, during the epoch of rotation or whatever was uh, causing these perturbations to appear. And uh, this object um, gives rise to all of the observables that we can see through radiative transfer, gravity, uh, other kinds of astrophysics. Really, er everything that we can observe arises from that. And so this, the big problem then becomes to take all of these, uh, all of these probes and invert this and learn about these primordial perturbations. So this is kind of the, the big problem that we're setting up. Um, and really the power of the CMB in all of this uh, is, is not so much that it gives you the largest number of modes or that it is ultimately, uh, you know, it has the highest signal to noise or something like this. No, in fact, it's the smallness that, that's the beauty of the CMB. The fact that these um, observed perturbations are so small means that we can um, reliably use uh, we can justify the use of linear perturbation theory to very high level of accuracy. And uh, this object here, this phi k, is just the Fourier transform of this 3D thing I, I just showed you. Um, and that's, that gets transformed just linearly into the observables. And, uh, and this transfer function, if we assume a homogeneous anastrophic universe, then this has a very, very simple form. So we just need to, uh, we basically need to um, uh, know these functions, and then we can infer this. Or in fact, it's a, it's a combination of the two. We can infer both these and these at the same time. And the fact that we can do this reliably and because of linear physics is actually quite simple. Uh, this is the power of the CMB. Um, so if you, if you take this seriously and you just do it explicitly, um, you can take, here's a simulation of the cosmic microwave background. Um, and I'm just showing you a patch here. Um, and in fact, this uses uh, simulated temperature and polarization and isotropies um, which are then uh, put into this, uh, you can build a linear time machine, basically an inverse problem that is full, can you, you can specify fully, where you stick in these observations and then get slices in this onion that I showed you before, um, which um, most of the information is centered around the uh, surface of last scattering. Um, but you can see that you can actually get some three-dimensional information. What I'm showing here is an animation of different slices uh, going through the surface of last scattering. Um, and uh, so I should uh, s say a couple of things about this. One is that this assumes adiabatic initial conditions. Right? If you have ice curvature, then there's another perturbation mode that you can, in principle, constrain the same way. But, um, but this is, I'm assuming here that, that that isn't there. So we're assuming adiabatic initial conditions. And so far, the data let us do that. Um, and the other thing I should say is that polarization actually plays a huge role in this. Um, the, the fact that this map looks pretty much like the simulation, even though it actually takes into account noise and, and so forth, uh, the fact that this, this looks like a pretty complete set of modes uh, reconstructed on each surface um, comes from the fact that you're combining temperature and polarization in, together. And the fact that the temperature and polarization transfer functions are, are, are out of phase give you the ability to, to create a seamless reconstruction of these modes. And the fact that the results I'll be showing you, for example, for doing this with, uh, with the uh, Planck data right now, um, only uses temperature. And so there's actually a huge chunk of modes missing uh, in, in this current reconstruction. This is why, uh, as we're looking beyond the series release, um, there's, there's a lot more to learn about. So uh, this, is, this plot is, is now classic. Um, uh, it's, it shows the, polarization, the inflation constraints from Planck um, confronted with uh, certain particular models. Um, and uh, well, I don't think I need to discuss this any further. Um, the energy scale of inflation is currently limited uh, to be less than 2 times 10 to the 16 GeV based on these results. 
And another thing you see is that um, chaotic inflation here is, is a little bit uh, under, fr under pressure. I'm sure this has been discussed in, in the parallel sessions yesterday and, and during the talks in the morning. Um, just one little comment on this. Uh, this, um, this analysis has been done with a flat prior. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's a Bayesian analysis that gives rise to these, uh, these contours. But in fact, prior choice, as you know, in Bayesian analysis has, has an, is important. Um, and uh, if you chose, you know, that you could justify saying that since we don't know anything about, the, if we didn't know anything about the scale of inflation, we should use a, a scale invariant prior for R. Um, and this is a cartoon that didn't do any calculation here, but this, that just shows you that a scale invariant prior would, would push you towards the lower bound, boundary of, um, of this distribution just by saying that uh, I don't know anything about, um, about the scale of inflation. If, and if you do this all the way to the lowest possible, you know, the, the uh, weak scale, uh, then you would actually concentrate a huge amount of probability mass really at the, at the, at the lower edge of this, of this plot. But maybe that's not the right uh, measure. That's, that's just uh, a, a way of, 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 uh, of, um, of talking about ignorance in the, in the, in the um, largest possible sense. Um, but maybe there are other, but there are other priors that, are, um, that one could use. So there are uh, theoretical ideas. And uh, again, without going into the details, you know, one of the exciting possibilities, one of the exciting prospects, I think, for connecting theory to this is that there are possibilities of actually deriving priors from, um, from higher energy uh, completions of inflation, which would, which would be physical and would actually allow you to, um, to help you to, to distinguish between different physical pictures uh, in which the physics of the early universe is embedded. So, um, okay, this, just this remark uh, for, uh, how we, for the importance, about the importance of priors. Um, so one of the key results, of course, is, and that's already been mentioned a few times, is that Harrison Zerdovich was ruled out um, uh, by Planck. Uh, the, the one little um, back door that remains open is that if you are willing to pay uh, for a Harrison Zerdovich spectrum with an extra neutrino species, then you can do it. Um, but uh, essentially in any other way, uh, um, the, you know, the um, NS is less than one with high significance. Flatness is another fundamental um, uh, quantity. Um, inflation um, generically predicts flatness at the level of 10 to the minus 5, though it's possible to create open universes, but close is hard. Uh, the Planck constraints right now are at the 10 to the minus 3 level. Um, and uh, What's interesting is that, if, if, it, if anything at all, the, the wiggle room is in the direction of positive curvature, um, but at the expense of, of also allowing for running. So it's, uh, it becomes a little bit arcane. Uh, and at some, at some level, you do have to cut off running because you do want to have enough inflation. Um, so, uh, but, but there's still a little bit, little bit of wiggle room there. Um, so going. Along this, this idea of testing early universe physics, uh, feet, we could ask, is there more information in the power spectrum than simply a power law um, or running? Uh, so there's a test in the Planck, um, Planck inflation paper, which looks at various mod parameterized modifications uh, of, this, um, of, of the, the adiabatic power spectrum. And while you can get some improvements in chi-squared, um, an evidence analysis uh, always favors the featureless model. You basically don't get enough, get enough of an improvement in chi-square to justify adding, um, adding these additional uh, parameters. And, uh, and there are, uh, have now been more extended searches of, uh, of Planck, uh, which, which agree with this uh, analysis. And there's also some earlier WMAP work, which is, which is consistent as well. So um, let's go back to the CMB map. This was an excursion into power spectrum, uh, into, into the two-point correlation, but we have the whole map. So uh, can, we, can we go or should we go beyond the two-point correlations? Well, going beyond two-point correlations pays. Um, and in fact, the three-point constraints uh, from Planck are currently the highest precision test of standard inflationary model predictions um, in the sense that uh, compared to um, 
you know, non-Gaussianity sort of at the order of one level, um, Planck currently places a constraint at the 0.1% level um, on the presence of, um, for example, local non-Gaussianity. Whereas um, flatness is in second place compared to an order of one uh, change in the, in the density of the universe, flatness constrains it at the 0.1% level, and isocurvature constraints are currently roughly at the 1% level, um, and hence there are these tight constraints on topological defects, cosmic strings, uh, and, and so forth that you've heard about from, from Joe. Um, so let's just uh, take one example uh, that's now well known, local non-Gaussianity, where you have, um, which is um, quite well modeled in terms of a, a Gaussian field, which has been non-linearly transformed in this way. Um, and it has a parameter here which characterizes the amplitude of non-Gaussianity. Um, you can use this to then predict the uh, three-point correlations um, very simply, and, and, it, and the prediction is proportional to NL. That's interesting because, in fact, the prediction at the power spectrum level is one order down in smallness. So this is, uh, this is the obvious way to look for this. Um, and because of linear transfer, you can just very simply take this transformed uh, initial perturbation just this three-dimensional object I showed you before, and projected onto the observations, ALM, um, and, um, uh, and compare it to observations. So uh, this signal is expected in standard inflation, but at very, very small levels. So here's the same thing in cartoons. Um, here's this 3D initial um, perturbation, the curvature perturbation. Uh, so this is the actually the non-Gaussian non -Gaussian, um, perturbation corresponding to this Gaussian one. Here is the CMB anisotropy corresponding to this particular realization. Uh, likewise, up here for the Gaussian part, and then uh, these get combined to produce a signal map. Uh, and then we're trying to look for uh, the presence of this um, of this parameter. Um, so. Looking into, uh, into L space now, this is a real space uh, illustration, but looking into L space, there are these, um, uh, so you, now you have three parameters, L1, L2, L3, because it's a three-point correlation, and there are these nice, nice visualizations of the um, bispectrum shapes that were developed here in Cambridge. Um, and they show uh, that there are different uh, the different uh, limits or different shapes of three-point correlations correspond to different physical effects. So for the local type, for example, uh, this, this, this occurs in multi-field models, um, um, like the curvaton, for example, and it's predicted in some to be there at significant levels in some uh, of these uh, bouncing universe models. Um, then there's... Um, Non-Gaussianity non of equilateral type, which uh, generically arises in models with non-canonical kinetic terms, so when you have higher derivatives in the Lagrangian. Um, and then this orthogonal type uh, also occurs in these models and can distinguish between different, um, different realizations of that. And so the idea is that we can look at these shapes, look for these shapes in the CMB, and distinguish between these different physical uh, signals. Um, so here are the same things again, and they correspond to here slices through the k-space correlations, um, and they correspond to these k-space correlations that we want to probe, and we can look for these different shapes as well as a whole host of other shapes. And this is this was done in the Planck uh, non-Gaussianity paper, and uh, the framework for describing these kind of modal expansions and for generalizing the, the estimator technology to, to do this is, was first, I think, described in this, uh, in this nice paper by Ferguson and Shellard. Um, so how do we then go and measure these uh, three-point correlations? Um, just thought I'd show you the formula. Um, essentially, um, you have a theoretical template like the one I just showed you. Um, in an isotropic universe, you know the end dependence of this um, of, of the bispectrum, you can factor it out, uh, and it's uh, just this gone factor here. Um, and uh, you then take this cubic combination of ALMs, uh, weighted uh, optimally in terms of the uh, inverse covariance, and then uh, subtract off a term 
which is uh, maybe you would have, wouldn't have thought of uh, in the first place and was um, I think first discussed in a very nice paper by Cominelli and, uh, and Salviarga and others, um, which, uh, which actually um, it has zero mean. So you can see this is a linear, linear term and by definition uh, the average perturbation for many, many realizations is zero. Uh, but actually the variance of this term is anti-correlated with the variance of this term in just such a way cancel for a given realization uh, variances and give you an improvement to the estimator. Um, so this is this variance reducing linear term. One way to understand this factor of three is that there's a theoretical result, mathematical result, which is quite neat, which is that for Gaussian, uh, the Hermite polynomial of a degree has the smallest variance. And so this is the, uh, this is the third order Hermite polynomial, you know, uh, x cubed minus 3x, uh, which gives you uh, which um, gives you some intuition about why, why this particular form arises. Um, so when you do this and you um, actually infer, uh, this is a smoothed version of the, of the Planck bispectrum, um, which has been uh, expanded in smooth modes, uh, uh, then this is the result. This is the data bispectrum. Um, and this is after foreground cleaning with the Smeeker method. Um, and then the game becomes to decide whether these fluctuations here are consistent with noise or not. One thing you might worry about, since I mentioned foreground cleaning, and we've heard a lot about foregrounds to today already in terms of uh, B modes, for example. So this is also a small signal. Um, how sensitive are we to foreground, um, this foreground cleaning? And here are three different foreground cleaning methods uh, shown in this modal representation. and um, uh, you know, while you, if you really stare at this carefully, you see small differences, it's pretty clear that, uh, that this is quite a robust result. Um, so uh, I won't go into all the details about testing these results and all the various null tests and uh, detailed checks that were made and all the redundant pipelines. The, uh, there is some hint of the redundancy shown here because the whole point of this table is that there are 12 times essentially the same number uh, except for differences that we actually understand on a theoretical level in terms of the differences between these different estimators. Uh, here's the, the, this is the headline result in the abstract showing that um, in these three standard shapes, um, non-Gaussianity is consistent with zero. Um, and it, you, know, you see the reduced error bars compared with earlier constraints. So, um, there were some people who really wanted there to be non-Gaussianity. Uh, it would have been great in the sense that it would have given you a completely new function to fit. It would have been more information about the early universe. Of course, these constraints also rule out a large number of models. But you know what? You might ask, well, is there some systematic, is there some reason, is there something that uh, would lead us astray, would lead us to believe that there isn't any non-Gaussianity? Um, maybe something about the processing of the time order data, something, some, something in the whole data pipeline that just uh, destroys non-Gaussianity and we're fooled. Um, uh, in particular, you might, well, let me just uh, say that. And um, So uh, is there something like that? Well, if there is something like that, um, of course we don't rule that out with 100% certainty, even though we do all these cross-checks and so forth. But if there is something like that, it has to let through all kinds of non-Gaussian signals which are seen uh, with high significance, okay? Uh, so for example, there's one that isn't seen with very high significance, but is expected just at uh, a the theoretical level as, as a, a known secondary effect, which is the ISW lensing correlation. I'll mention that uh, a little bit more uh, later on. This is a weak signal, 2.6 sigma, but is seen at a level consistent with expectations from lambda CDM. If there were some contaminant, big contaminant, or uh, if, if um, uh, if something in the processing just, just liked to uh, erase all squeezed type signals, which is like the local non-Gaussianity signal, um, there's no reason why this, why this should be there. Um, but we find it and it's at a level consistent with expectations. Um, there is a very, very strong detection, I mean, uh, 40, over 40 sigma of the CIB lensing cross correlation, which is also a squeezed type bispectrum, uh, similar to the local. And it's not just there, uh, you know, by chance, but it's actually consistent with the observed um, cosmic infrared background auto spectrum. So, um, uh, 
so this is another hint that, and this, this is on small scale, so this is another, another hint uh, that uh, you know, the, the pipeline doesn't just generically destroy non-gas energy. Um, you know, one of the headline results of Planck, and I'll show you the maps in a, in a minute, is, that len is the lensing detection. 25 sigma, this is a very different kind of uh, non-gas energy, uh, but um, uh, you know, clearly let through by the, by the processing, and it's also a small-scale signal. Um, and you know, as you know, most of the uh, statistical significance from Planck also comes from a combination of small and large scales for the, for the local non-gas energy, for example. Um, there is uh, the detected high L anisotropy due to peculiar motion, um, which is you know, at a sensi sensible level and in a plausible direction. Um, and we also see a residual point source signal uh, even after foreground cleaning um, which, is, which is not surprising, is at roughly at the, at the level of estimates um, at five sigma. Um, so there are all these different non-Cassian signals that in some ways are, are similar to the, the ones that we're looking for, and they all, um, they all make it through the pipeline, um, either before cleaning, such as this one, or, or after cleaning. Um, and then in, on top of that, we also agree with the WMAP9 findings in, at low L, um, where WMAP is signal dominated. So, um, well, if you can come up with a, with a systematic or if you can come up with some data processing artifact that uh, allows all of these through but um, somehow destroys primordial versions of non gas uh, then I'd be interested to hear about it. So, um, very interested to hear about it. <laughs> uh, so, um, so what can we learn from these results? Um, well, one very nice uh, way of describing in a, a more generic way um, inflationary Lagrangians is in terms of this effective field theory approach where you can write down terms on the Lagrangian and then test each coefficient of each term uh, by looking at the, um, at the endpoint function it produces and measuring that in the data. And uh, you can do this for, for these parameters, and this is the, this is the constraint plot. Um, so this is a very nice way of, um, of making contact with theory. And this has an impact on uh, the ability to say things in a less model-dependent way. Uh, so, for example, if you, uh, if you have no constraint on the sound speed of inflation, uh, sound speed during inflation, then there's a complete degeneracy in, this, uh, in the measurement of these epsilon 1, epsilon 2, these are the slow roll parameters. Um, and can, so the data are, don't give, give you a complete degeneracy. If you fix the sound speed to 1, you get this tight constraint up here. Um, and now, though, you can um, add the constraints derived from the higher order endpoint functions, and that, does, and that breaks the de degeneracy at least at some level, so making you a little less um, dependent on external assumptions. So the summary of the results is that, the non-gas energy results, is that um, slowly rolling single-scalar field models are highly consistent with the Planck data. This does not mean that we've now ruled out all multi-field models. There is still a window of, um, uh, you know, of a combination which, which we're not yet sensitive to. Um, we can also rule out small sound speed during inflation, which leads to the breaking of this degeneracy. And the map is consistent with a standard uh, initial vacuum. And uh, as such, the data constrain this class of ekvarotic or cyclic models, which, um, uh, which had a uh, prediction out there for how much local non-gas entity we should see, and at least for a certain class of these models, that we did not see that, and that's now ruled out at high significance. So what's next for the challenge? Um, is to, to go and um, measure, to say something about the paradigm of initial perturbations, paradigms of cosmic beginnings from the CMB data. And here's, here are the results that we see from Planck 2013. Can we think about, and this is for generic inflationary models, but can we learn something about what's going on at higher uh, energy scales? So we already heard about uh, the measurements of the tensor to scalar ratio to test large field models. There are st some stringy motivations for oscillatory potentials, and this motivated some of the oscillation analysis that I uh, already referred to. Um, and uh, one interesting um, de recent development is that there is 
a large class of inflationary models that, are, that can be realized in the context of supersymmetric uh, theories and supergravity. And uh, there is a uh, particular solution. So as you vary a parameter, you get essentially a family of models which lie, roughly speaking, it depends a little bit on the particular uh, uh, realization of this idea, but they, they lie, roughly speaking, in this range. And as a function of the parameter, it just takes you um, into the center of the Planck constraints, which is, uh, which is maybe surprising, but it makes contact with the Starobinsky model, which is, which is sitting down there. And here are references um, for these papers. So this, uh, this is interesting. I think this is particularly interesting because uh, there is a, at this attractor point, so as you let this parameter go and uh, become large, you, you reach this um, prediction for R um, in the context of these models, which is not zero. Uh, it's, and N is the number of uh, E-folds during inflation. Um, and I will show in a minute uh, what we could do about that in uh, upcoming experiments. So talking more about fundamental physics, one of the results um, that doesn't get a huge amount of press, um, uh, but that's in the Planck parameters paper, is the uh, constraint on the fine structure constant, which has actually improved quite significantly with Planck and is now uh, constrained at the 1% level. Uh, another result that I think is just neat um, is, the, um, is the constraints on global topology, so non-trivial topologies. What I'm showing here is just for illustration, um, the one row of the covariance matrix, the theory covariance matrix for a simply connected universe, uh, so centered at a pixel here at the North Pole, and then for other kinds of topologies. Um, and uh, so there's Basically, it does all these um, analyses for different radii of the unit cell, and turns out that the fundamental domain size is just constrained to be larger than, in all of these models, than the distance to the surface of last scattering. So looking uh, further beyond Planck and, and beyond the uh, ground-based missions that, that we heard about this morning, or in the previous session, um, there are now concepts for going, really going beyond Planck with a, with a follow-up uh, space mission, um, which, and this is, the, uh, this is the Cadillac version of this. Um, PRISM, the name was chosen, I think, a week before the other PRISM was discovered. Um, uh, but uh, you can ask me in the break if you don't know what I'm talking about. Um, and uh, so this is a mission that has a lot of science goals. It, it can do inflationary B-modes. It can probe new physics through looking at CMB spectral distortions with an extra instrument on board. Uh, it will give you a full view of primordial perturbations in polarization, um, basically doing for polarization what Planck is aiming to do for temperature. Um, the, it is the ultimate survey of, of clusters of galaxies. We get, we'll get all clusters of galaxies in the universe um, of a mass 10 to the 14 and above. And by looking at the B-mode lensing signal, um, can get neutrino masses, constrained neutrino masses, um, at the level of 0.04 electron volt from the CMB alone. So let me just um, show you a couple of plots um, from the white paper. Um, here is, uh, here is a plot of the threshold, detection threshold for massive clusters in the universe. Here is just seeing it using the sinyav zadovich effect, seeing a cluster. So as long as it's 10 to the 14 or, or above, you see all of them. Um, more exciting about this is that um, you see all massive clusters. So uh, you have a few times 10 to the 14 um, solar masses in the kinetic SE effect, which means that you get a peculiar a velocity survey of the, um, of the entire universe that is populated with massive clusters. Uh, and there's just no other way of doing that. Um, we don't know any other way of, of getting velocities out to large distances uh, in this way. Uh, and this is very exciting because it allows you to test other kinds of fundamental physics, for example, um, departures from general relativity um, and other things uh, that, that are um, that are just not accessible with any other method. Um, with this, with this, one, with this the prism, prism, you may even be able to see the um, polarization of the sinyav zadovich effect, which would give you more information about the modes um, uh, that, that cross our Hubble volume that are, that are not just confined to the, surface, to the surface of our light cone, but actually fill in partially information from inside the light cone, which is another exciting prospect. So looking at this inflation plot, this is for a um, 
slightly a downsized version of PRISM, which is called CORE. Um, but this is just this, this uh, Starobinsky model that we'd seen before. And you can see that with, even with this smaller version, we would be able to, um, to detect uh, R modes I I for this particular model. And uh, with PRISM we can, and delensing, and especially the extremely uh, broad coverage and frequency and very detailed coverage and frequency, which was gi which give uh, the prism the ultimate the ultimate power in terms of uh, rejecting foreground perturbations, uh, foreground effects, um, astrophysical foregrounds, collective foregrounds. That together with with high signal to noise delensing could get you to a few times ten to the minus four in the R sensitivity, which would rule out this point with very high significance. So this is really deep in the you know, really go a long way towards uh, well. It would just rule out large field inflation. Um, so then there's more fundamental physics um, that we're already seeing hints of. The late time um, erasure of uh, structure that's caused by dark energy driving the accelerated expansion, uh, which is seen in this 2.6 signal effect. So here's another way of seeing that, which is cross-correlating um, locations of large voids and large clusters with uh, with the, um, uh, with the CMB shows, uh, shows some signal, but even at the three-point correlation level, uh, just from lensing alone, uh, we see uh, nearly three sigma, and this will get a little bit better uh, next year. Um, and PRISM would expect to see this at nine sigma, and really this would be the most, uh, the strongest constraints on ISW um, uh, that, that we could get, period, <laughs> uh, with any, any measure. Here's just, uh, if you squint your eyes, you can, you can, this is the ISW lensing bispectrum, and you can sort of see a little bit of it here in these corners, um, but it's 2.6 sigma, uh, but we think we can see it. Um, the uh, lensing, as I said, one of the exciting results in Planck here is the Planck lensing map. Prism would go beyond that and make a high, high signal to noise map of, of the mass of the universe. And the analogy really is that you, if, if Planck is like Kobe when it comes to lensing, uh, PRISM is like WMAP. So it really would give you a huge amount of extra, uh, extra information. And combining this with, with measures of, of the Baron acoustic oscillation scale would give you a way of distinguishing between the normal and inverted neutrino hierarchies just because B modes, uh, lens, lensing B modes, if you have high sensitivity, are just uh, extremely sensitive to uh, it's the sum of the masses, the neutrino masses. Here is uh, something else to look forward to, dark matter annihilation in terms of its effect on the CMB. Basically, uh, you can change the distance to the last scattering surface by injecting thermal energy. Um, and I'm only showing the Planck forecast because currently with temperature alone, Planck doesn't do much better than WMAP, but with polarization, it should, uh, it should get into this regime. And then something like uh, you know, a next generation experiment would, would dig even further. And this is interesting because at least for these low uh, masses uh, of dark matter particles, we're beginning to touch on the thermal WIMP regime. So we're really beginning to test um, standard dark matter. Um, and this is the constraints that are currently already competitive in, some, in the low mass regime uh, with local measures um, in, uh, fr from local galaxies. Okay, just one last word about um, spectral distortions. Uh, you can see any form of heating, uh, particle decays, topological defects, and that beyond the surface glass scattering due to the imprint on the spectrum uh, of the CMB in terms of mu and y distortions. Um, and this is just a plot showing the sen predicted sensitivity for PRISM, which would even allow you to detect these recombination lines in an integrated way, not any shapes, but uh, in terms of you, know, you would get uh, a little bit, so even in standard uh, scenarios, you might see a hint of that. Uh, but for example, uh, silk damping, standard silk damping would, would be, would gives, actually gives a spectral distortion that will be visible. And certainly if there's any small scale power, on, you know, at, at very small scales, invisible in CMB and large scale structure, uh, this would show up in this measure. So non-Gaussianity uh, would give you a huge improvement over Planck at just a uh, factor of 30 uh, after, of, in terms of this constraint volume in the three-shape uh, three space. Uh, and then there's initial constraint on very small scales uh, using the spectral distortions. 
So to conclude, uh, hoping making up a little, hopefully making up a little bit uh, for, for last time. Or last time. Um, uh, the currently the current situation is that Gaussian initial conditions um, are, uh, are in good shape. Um, we're seeing results that are consistent with slowly rolling single scalar field inflation models. Uh, there are questions about how to embed this in a larger, uh, larger um, theory and a, in a larger paradigm. Um, the new constraint volume for the uh, main non Gaussian shapes now is 20 times smaller than pre Planck, which has led to uh, ruling out uh, classes of models. Uh, and we do see non-primordial non gas energy at levels consistent with expectation and, and for some of them at very high significance. Uh, but really, as has been emphasized by several people this, this morning, polarization and then at the next step, spectral distortions are, are really important, are the next step because they massively increase the number of modes available to test fundamental physics. Thanks. Okay, thanks. Uh, there's only time for a very quick question, if there is one at all. Uh, otherwise, Dave, can you come and set up? Uh, yes, Costas. Can you hear? Yes. Okay, uh, just one quick question, uh, not on non Gaussianity, but on statistical anisotropy at low uh, multiples. Uh, there was a big hype about this uh, issue when the first uh, you know, blank results appeared, but it seems that uh, people are not talking about that anymore. Why is that? Um. <laughs> you talked about the topology oh, of the universe. About this <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I think you know part of it is that it's. Uh, I mean, taken by itself, for example, the low L anisotropy, uh, the, the lack of power. Uh, is interesting, I think, because this is the best view we'll ever have of these large low L modes. But the statistical significance uh, is, you know, is very, mod very moderate to small. Um, you know, with, with two of order two sigma uh, statistical significance. Then there are these alignment effects. Each one of these, it, you know, has a small, uh, relatively small statistical significance. I think the excitement there is that if if somebody comes up with a model that convincingly hits all of those dots and explains the several you know, two sigma order effects, there could be something uh, interesting to say. Uh, I think at this point, there, there isn't such, such a development, and that may be why um, Is there, why there some hasn't sort been of much more discussion of that. On this? Is there some sort of upper bound at the level of 50%? On what, sorry? An upper bound on statistical anisotropy. Oh, yeah. I mean, these are described in the papers. The, the papers are a bit muddled on this. <laughs> well, that's partially because the notion of statistical anisotropy is not very crisp, right? It depends on your parameterization, and this is why you see uh, several tests of that, and, you know, they all have slightly different results. And this is just the uh, nature of not being in a theory-driven regime. And um, we're, you know, this is, by contrast, when we're doing tests of primordial non gaussianity we have theoretically motivated templates that we can test and then be very, we can be very precise about what kind of constraints we derive. But, but if you're looking for strangeness, uh, you have to parameterize it somehow, and of course you have some freedom how to do that. A, a, another answer might be there are some revised papers which will be available soon. Okay. <laughs> uh, anyway, let's thank uh, Ben again. <laughs>
and looking at um, an independent reanalysis of the Planck data that Rene Vlasic, Raphael Flauger, and I have been doing, where we've taken the publicly released data and tried to recompute parameters and seen what conclusions we've come to. The second is I thought it would be a nice opportunity just to give people a quick update on what's going on in the United States with uh, WFIRST and AFTA. Uh, what the, as um, some of you may know, we were given as a gift a 2.4 meter Hubble-sized telescope with a wide field of view and asked, would this be useful for dark energy studies, for other astrophysics? We came back with a positive conclusion. And I just want to give people a sense of where that's going to, what's going on with that, because looking ahead in cosmology at what we will be doing for precision cosmology in you know, a decade from now, I think a very important part of that picture will be work we'll all, a lot, many of us will be doing using lensing to characterize a large-scale distribution of structure, other measurements of distances, and I think what will likely be the three key observational tools we'll have for that will be LSST on the ground, Euclid in space, and I think many people here are very familiar with Euclid, but another part of that story will be this W first after mission, so I want to talk about that. I just want to begin by reminding people of the remarkably consistent picture of the CMB. Um, here it is in the same color scheme. <laughs> and all the important features like the SH appears in all of them. And this consistent picture also appears when you look at uh, smaller scales. Um, if we go uh, this, look at the ACT data. Up, sorry. Thought I had it set up to pop up. This is the Planck sky map. This is the Axe sky map on the same region. You see the same fluctuations at the same location. And this is just a real space representation of what Joanna Dunkley showed of the data being remarkably consistent. And then looking at the, uh, this is looking again at the consistency between WMAP and Planck. And this shows the cross correlation between the 100 gigahertz Planck data with its 217, WMAP 94 gigahertz with 217, shifted by this about 1.2 percent in amplitude, about 2.4 to 2.7 percent in power, this factor we need to normalize it. And I think you can see once you've done that amplitude shift, which we're all working to understand, um, the data sets are remarkably consistent. And you can see they, this is on the same patch of the sky. They agree very well at low multiples where WMAP is um, cosmic variance limited. And out here, you can see that they're consistent. And Planck's lower noise allows you to get this precision measurement of the power spectrum you know, really all the way out you know, to 2,000 to 2,500 range. And this figure here is flashing back and forth between the pre-release and Planck measurements. And you can see overall they're remarkably consistent, but now with Planck filling in this part of the spectrum with much higher precision. And another way to look at that is that the parameters are mostly consistent. And I'll talk about this a bit more in the next few minutes. But if you look at, see, here are the kind of four key parameters I want to focus on. This was our best estimates pre-release of parameters from WMAP plus ACT. And here's the Planck plus WMAP polarization numbers. And all these parameters tend to be kind of correlated with each other. And there's basically a shift of about a sigma in the WMAP parameters in the Hubble constant going down the matter density going up, and S going down a bit. And that shift, on one hand, um, is consistent within the two data sets. But when you look at other astronomical data, and this is something uh, George talked about, um, you start to see interesting deviations. And this is from the Planck paper. This figure's uh, been corrected by the Planck team because the neutrino mass was not included. 
When you do that, the red curve comes down a bit, and they kind of kiss. But there's still a significant difference between the sigma-8 omega matter value uh, that measured from uh, the CMB and those inferred by clusters or gravitational lensing. So that the two to three sigma level depends exactly what data set you look at. The Hubble constant is inferred from Planck is now with that one sigma shift down. It's now getting a little uncomfortable. And there's, uh, you know, the high amplitude of density fluctuations are also a little high relative to a lot of the ground-based results. And I think this suggests one of three uh, interesting possibilities. Uh, the most interesting is that this is pointing to new physics. And as the data improves, this two or three sigma deviation becomes a five sigma deviation. And we identify the new physics, whether it's neutrino sector or something else that's going on here. The second possibility is that there's systematics in the astronomical data. And, you know, the astronomical data sets are more complex, and that may be what's going on there. But I think it's also worth considering, are there some systematics in the Planck data? And this motivated us to go look at the Planck data. It's also motivated by some of the trends seen in the uh, Planck analysis, things like the dependence of the parameters on, particularly on the 217 cross 217, uh, driving the data, and some funny features in the 217 um, power spectrum. Um, you know, you see these, this is the deviation of the 217 power spectrum showing this feature around of L of 1800. My understanding is that it's now understood to be a systematic and is improved in later data analysis. And there's also a number of null tests. So if you look at, this is a comparison, this is from Planck paper six, of the power spectrum uh, measured from different detector set pairs. And at 100 and 143 gigahertz, they all pass the test. At 217 gigahertz, there's a number of detector set pairs that don't pass the test. And you see deviations at the level of you know, 20, 30 microkelvin squared um, in the, the differences. So that motivated us to go look at the uh, Planck data and to see you know, what could we do with the publicly available data. So we took the publicly available data that doesn't include the detector set map, so we can only measure cross-spectrum from different seasons. That has the advantage, actually, of their, when you're looking at two completely independent seasons, um, any uh, systematics tend to drop out. One of the things we do in our ground-based analysis, for example, with ACT, and I believe the SPT team does a similar thing, is you just take observations measured on different days and, and always work with cross-correlations. One, in doing that, we had to, that reduces the amount of data available, so it blows up the errors a bit. So we wanted to use more sky, so we also wanted to make use of the 353 and 545 Planck maps for cleaning. And they turn out, as I'll show in a moment, to be remarkably good at cleaning up the sky. Um, you can see that in things like the component separation analyses, but they're, they're uh, a very powerful addition to the lower frequency maps in terms of characterizing what's going on. And in doing this analysis, we basically stuck with the CAM um, likelihood package. Uh, of course, since we're using different data sets, we had to recompute the covariance matrices and plug them in. So first, let's just look at, uh, just within the CAM likelihood, the sensitivity of parameters to the data included. So if we remove the 217, 217 gigahertz uh, data from the Planck analysis. So it's just taking the CAM spec as is. Let's see what happens when we remove this. This is actually looked at in um, uh, paper 15 in the Planck analysis, but we redid it here. And you can see it shifts all the parameters from these values here to values that are almost identical to the WMAP uh, 9 plus ACT results. So uh, it suggests, you know, whatever difference we're seeing is driven by 217 cross 217. And that's the spectrum that, you know, we saw these problems in the detector sets of the null tests. Um, the cleaning lets us use a, a lot more sky, show that in a couple ways. This is just the effect of cleaning with 545. So what's shown on the left is the power spectrum completed, um, 
computed with different uh, frequency combinations. Usually in the Planck analysis, you see the bottom couple here, the ones in the triangle shown. Because these other combinations have so much foreground in them, you can't use them without a lot of foreground modeling. But just using the dust seems to correlate extremely well, have a relatively close to constant uh, spectral index across this, uh, the high latitude sky. Because all we did here was to find what linear combination minimizes the variance, remove that one number from each of the maps, and this is the cleaned up spectrum. And you can see even the 353 cross 353 spectrum, which started up way up there, comes down to here. So the maps clean up very nicely. Given that, we decided to use them to use larger sky. Um, what we did to minimize the contribution of the, the 353 and the 545 maps to the uh, noise is we took one map, which was clean on 217 or 145 and 100, we did the same thing with all of them, that was clean with 353, one map that was cleaned with 545, and cross-correlated them to reduce the contribution to the noise. And we compute the spectrum. This is a mask shown above that's uh, very close to the Planck mask used in the analysis of the 217, except for since we don't have, we only have the cross seasons, we have to throw out the region that was only observed at one season. That's this ecliptic strip here. You can see it come across there. Then we also move to a much larger sky coverage here. And the two spectrum are shown here. By, of course, going by to larger F sky, this is about an F sky of about uh, half the sky, you get smaller errors. And this is the difference between the two spectrum measured at 217 as a function of L. And there's just no difference, right? So this is a lot like the double differences that are done in the Planck analysis. But now we're doing this on the clean maps. And there seems to be no evidence uh, for galactic foregrounds. So we then take these new spectra, plug them into the likelihood codes, and see what comes out. And here's on top is the clean spectra with its best fit model. Here's the Planck uh, C and B the released ones and their best fit. And you can see it's a bit better fit, particularly around the high L region. And when you look at what it does to parameters, it shifts the parameters. So the black curve is our analysis with 217 and without 217, giving a bit larger, the sort of one sigma higher Hubble constant. Very consistent with the Planck data, the Planck analysis without 217. And sort of, so all this shift seems to be coming from uh, the detector set crosses. And with this, you see even less evidence for new physics. The neutrino mass likelihood curve gets closer to zero. The best fit and effective now centered around three. Things go, get a little, even more boring. Um, though, if you like m squared phi squared, this one sigma shift now moves m squared phi squared uh, more deeply into the uh, two sigma allowed region. So what's going on here? Why is this parameter shift happening? Um, it seems to be driven by 217. 217, mostly the difference in the 217, 217 detector sets. Um, when we went through this analysis the first time, and I talked about this at, uh, at Irvine, sorry, Davis, I emphasized the um, cleaning because I knew that was one of the differences. But now that we've run through the likelihood code where we take our maps without cleaning, stick them into the code, you actually get, in terms of omega cold dark matter and NS, this is the Planck uh, with 217 in the X. Up here is the Planck release spectra without 217, very close to what we get with the cross-season spectra, either with or without 217, when we do the cleaning. When we don't do the cleaning and just fit with, uh, with the code, we actually even get a larger omega CNS. 
So it's not the cleaning that's making the difference, it's the uh, detector set pairs. And um, another way of just looking at the changes is if you look at the difference in the spectrum that's released once you remove the best fit foreground models, the 217, 217 is a bit low in the upper plot um, compared to 143, 217. When we go through our analysis, we get one that's more consistent with the 143, 217. Um, these shifts are all one sigma shifts in parameters. And some of this is driven by the fact that you're adding extra data. And I don't, we don't, can't tell from what's there, what's released, whether this is pointing to some systematic or just the effect of adding extra data. Um, you know, the thing that I hope we encourage people the team to do is release the detector set maps um, because that will allow uh, external checks that, uh, you know, uh, the deviations with uh, astronomical measurements I think are interesting enough and important enough that even at this kind of one sigma level it's worth trying to understand them. Um, and of course all of this is going to be a lot clearer when we have five seasons, right? So. Um, my experience with uh, uh, WMAP was um, the more data we had, the better we understood things. Um, also, one of the things we found was the more data we had, um, any two sigma anomaly just tended to go away. You know, all the things that seemed to be a little bit off, uh, with more data, things seemed to improve. So I think we're all looking forward to seeing the um, the five season temperature maps and, and then next the, the polarization maps and uh, uh, see what, what that shows. Um, you know, I think um, perhaps the overall uh, takeaway from this is first, you know, get, having to, an opportunity to work closely with the Planck data, you see the remarkable quality of the data. And I actually think with the 343s and the 545s, there's an opportunity for the Planck team to make more use of them because I think they can allow you to lose, use a larger F Scott. Um, I also think, at least for the data that's released, there seems to be some issue in the detector sets uh, crosses in the 217s. Um, and they, if those maps are released, I think that could be understood uh, better. And I think this data is so important to cosmology that it's really, uh, I hope we're providing a service by coming back and revisiting the data. One of the things that um, we certainly benefited from in the WMAP team was having uh, external analyses, people coming up using different techniques, and we certainly learned from what other people did with uh, WMAP data. So now let me change hats completely. I'll move into my Washington, D.C. mode, put on a jacket. I really ought to put on a tie and nicer pants, but, you know, this is all I have with me. Um, and talk a little bit about this, now, as I say, now for something completely different, um, story of what's been going on with this telescope. So this was a, a, has been so far a very interesting thing to be involved with. I got a phone call about a year and a half ago from folks at NASA headquarters saying, we can now talk about the fact that we have a 2.4 meter telescope that was given to us by another agency. Um, as uh, some of you may know, NASA is our third largest space agency. There's an article in the Washington Post three or four days ago that actually gives out the budgets of the other agencies, and it is indeed the third largest agency. Um, one of the uh, other agencies had a telescope from a canceled program. It's a 2.4 meter telescope, oh, optical telescope assembly. Um, it uh, was designed to look down, and it's a wide field telescope. And they asked us, would this be useful? The fact that it was available suggests to me one of two things. Either the U.S. government feels you can learn enough by listening and you don't have to look anymore. <laughs> or that they have something better. Um, so, uh, we had a couple workshops on this, and after some uh, stimulated NASA headquarters to uh, ask us to look at this, and uh, NASA put together a study team 
uh, to spend uh, last year looking at what you could do with this telescope and was it uh, suited for the top priority of the U.S. Decadal Survey, the W First mission. And we had, fortunately, a very good team of people uh, who worked with us on it. And the same team is now carrying forward and it, with a few additional members to continue to explore this mission. The basic conclusion we came to was perhaps not shocking. A 2.4 meter telescope is more capable than a 1.3 meter telescope. And that the telescope um, could be used uh, for a, or as a three mirror astigmat. Um, we were actually get, the, the setup we have is only the primary and secondary. The tertiary was part of a, an instrument that was removed. Um, and that we concluded that not only did this meet the requirements set in the decadal survey for the science, with the larger aperture, it exceeded it and enabled a wide range of new things. And one of the things that was um, quite interesting to look at, and we're continuing to explore now in more detail, is having this telescope meant we could put a coronagraph on it. One of the things that was considered by a number of studies in the U.S. Decadal Survey was flying sort of a one meter class coronagraphic mission. And the cost of that turned out to be around a billion dollars, and the science return was somewhat limited. And this was not, while well, there was a lot of interest in, in the exoplanet community, it do, did not emerge as a top priority, particularly given our limited budget. But given that we have the telescope already, and it turns out that there are coronagraph designs, and we're focusing right now uh, on choosing the exact approach we want to use for the coronagraph, um, the larger telescope and having it available makes it relatively inexpensive to include a coronagraph and do interesting exoplanet work. So the basic plan is to have a wide field instrument that will operate the near infrared, right? So in contrast to Euclid, which is going to be doing its imaging and, and lensing work in the optical, this will be operating in the near infrared 0.7 to 2 microns. Right now, the two micron cutoff is set by the fact that the telescope was designed to look down and operate at a warmer temperature. We're uh, now studying whether or not we can run it cooler. We're hoping to push that limit to 2.4 microns. The plan is to have a, about 0.28 square feet degree field of view, 18 uh, H4RG detectors are the next generation uh, IR detectors, 288 uh, megapixels. And our current plan is to, we have the current design is four filters. We're thinking those details are something that's under study, what we'll do with filters. Plan to use a GRISM and have an IFU on it for spectroscopy of the supernova. In addition to that, we'd have a chronograph. Now, the chronograph operates in the optical from about 400 to 1,000 nanometers. We're looking at achieving a contrast of about 10 to the 9 in the chronograph. Uh, 10 to the 10 is what people hope to do for Earth-like planets. So a 10 to the 9, we're looking at um, not just detecting, but characterizing the atmospheres of um, massive exoplanets, Neptunes and Jupiters. And if we're very lucky, and there's an Earth-like planet around you know, Alpha Centauri or a handful of the nearest targets, perhaps look at that. But the tar we're really designing it for the um, giant planets. One way to look at this is to say about the every HST picture you've seen, and to realize when you've got this field of view, it's 200 times the field of view. So every time you've pointed Hubble, you now get 200 times the area. And I think this enormous area in, in the infrared gives us the ability to address many of the outstanding questions in uh, cosmology and astrophysics in general. A lot of the questions were we identified in the decadal survey, and we've been talking about in the meeting here. So the plan for the survey is to carry out a deep survey. Um, in many ways, this is very complementary to Euclid, right? Euclid's going to cover of order 20,000 square degrees. And while Euclid's quite deep, by the standards as we'll see, this will go much deeper on a smaller fraction of the sky. So the plan is to look at about 2,000 square degrees of high latitude sky, about 500 million lens galaxies, so we're now looking at about 70 galaxies per arc minute squared. That's a much deeper lensing map. You could look at about 20 galaxies per arc minute squared when you're looking at LSST or Euclid. 
um, looking at about 40,000 massive clusters. We'll do, with the IFU, we'll uh, have high quality supernova data, carry out a large supernova survey, do spectroscopy going out to redshift three using a combination of H alpha from redshift one to two and oxygen three from redshift two to three. And also do things like uh, redshift space distortions to look at velocities. When we looked at the parameters, all these methods are giving us 0.1 to 0.4 percent precision. There have been previous studies of doing W first with smaller telescopes, and the basic conclusion we came to was bigger is indeed better. Um, we also felt that it was something that was quite, as I mentioned, complementary uh, to Euclid in that we're uh, going, you know, deeper. Uh, covering, you know, Euclid for, say, spectroscopy. You're, this is the NP you're looking at around the BAO peak. Uh, he, here we're going to an NP of order one, pushing out to redshift three. We'll also do very interesting things for exoplanet science, both carrying out a microlensing survey. Here's the range, sorry, this didn't reproduce that, that well, in mass semi-major axis covered by Kepler. For lensing, we'll cover this region here. For uh, exoplanet imaging, we will, see here's a better version of that plot. So for microlensing, we're looking at discovering about 2,800 planets given the current values from Kepler and just extrapolating them out. The combination of the two will provide detailed kind of statistical uh, sampling of the distribution of exoplanets. Um, in addition to the microlensing work, we'll also do imaging. This sort of shows the region that this will push to in sensitivity compared to what's being done from the ground and what's planned from the ground with 30 meter telescopes. Uh, also looking at what one will do with uh, debris skies imaging. Uh, my time's running late, so let me just uh, quickly mention that one of the things that will be quite interesting here is to look at the distribution of dark matter. Uh, there have been remarkable results coming for uh, HST on things like the CLASH survey where we're looking at the distribution of dark matter. The thing to th keep about, think about here is we will carry out a survey like CLASH but over 2,000 square degrees. Right? So you'll have Hubble quality imaging um, but now with 200 times the field of view. And, uh, get these detailed arcs. I'll keep going. And that's just a small part of the view. Um, other things I think that will be quite interesting for this, it will be quite complementary to JWST because it will be surveying the sky, large areas of the sky. So you'll be able to find, for example, uh, with current extrapolation, tens or hundreds of galaxies out to redshift 12, 13, 14. You'll see these things in the near IR, and then JWST will, will follow up on this. So this will be a great finder telescope for JWST for a number of applications. It'll also be, I think, in terms of its astrometry, a very nice um, complement to Gaia. Because where we will do multiple imaging, uh, if our plan is to spread the imaging program out over the life of the mission, and that gives us enough baseline that we can do astrometry about four magnitudes through deeper than Gaia. Lower, we expect, suspect our systematic limit will not go as deep as Gaia. So for bright stars, Gaia will be much better. But this will tie to the Gaia frame and let us do things like look at motions of, uh, you know, main sequence stars in tidal streams of dwarf galaxies and look and be able to do things like constrain the amount of substructure in the dark, our dark matter halo, which will in turn give us insight into whether, what the dark matter is made of. I'm reaching the end, so let me conclude by just noting for some things like Here's the M31 survey that was done with H, being done by HST right now, led by Julianne Del Canton. That survey took 432 pointings to survey M31. 
Our plan is to spend at least 25% of the time doing general astrophysics. And you can do projects like that in uh, two, of two pointies. It'll be quite, um, I think, uh, we'll have a very nice map of the sky with the combination of LSST, Afton, and Euclid. So in terms of sensitivity, it very nicely complements LSST, represents sort of about a factor 100 improvement on the survey uh, sensitivity of, of Sloan. You're going about 100 times deeper with LSST, about 100 times deeper here, but now covering, because of the observation in the infrared, you know, uh, almost uh, an order of magnitude in wavelength range. And in terms of image quality, Euclid will provide really striking images in the optical of galaxies at almost the same um, resolution. Uh, this telescope will provide near-infrared images. So this looks very promising. We presented this to headquarters, uh, put on the jacket and tie, talked to the NASA administrator, congressional staff, OMB, and we've got this into the language in both the House Authorization Bill, so we got the Republicans to like it, and we got the Democrats to really like it. So there's $56 million in the Senate Authorization Bill. Uh, when will it launch? If JWST stays on budget, uh, so far it's been since the rebudgeting. They were given enough budget at the moment that looks reasonably that is possible. <laughs> um, this would fit into the NASA budget profile for astrophysics, and the current plan by the astrophysics division is to go into phase A in 2017 and launch in 2023. The optimistic scenario is if that Senate language is adopted in the um, House-Senate compromise, and who knows what's going to happen in Washington with the budget this year, um, that would actually schedule a 2021 launch. So I think either way, this is something that's likely going to happen um, in the Euclid LSST time frame. So when people are thinking about what's coming, I think this is likely an important part of the picture. As many of you know, um, NASA is uh, a, a minor partner in Euclid. I think one of the things that worked very well for the U.S. community, and I think also benefited Planck and also Herschel, was to have U.S. participation in Planck and Herschel. Uh, the same thing I hope will happen with Euclid. I believe that there will be opportunities, if there's interest on the ESA side, for European participation in uh, in W first, this after W first mission, right now the Canadians and Japanese are both sending um, observers to our upcoming meeting next week, and uh, the reason for this advertisement was a hope to stimulate interest in Europe and potential European involvement in the mission. Let me stop there. Thanks. Okay. To see that cosmology will continue to be a data-driven field. Now, I'm sure there are some questions about the talk. I mean, I realize it's lunchtime, but perhaps some blank people want to respond a little bit. <laughs> oh, George. Um, right. So, that, I mean, what we did um, in terms of sky coverage and cleaning was. I think very, very conservative. And in fact, you know, you can use the same methodology and push sky coverage with the template based and, right. you know, mass difference dust approach. Um, the, the, the thing that worries me about um, using 353 and, you know, 545 for cleaning is, is do you really know what is going on? with the unresolved foregrounds because, you know, the likelihood is is being pulled by the high multipoles, you know, where you've got high signal to noise. So if you get it slightly wrong, you, you know, if you get the cleaning slightly wrong, it will pull parameters. I mean, we're very, very close, right, in right. the numbers, but, you you know, we have right. to worry about right. well, what, we what's get, actually going on. We get the same numbers, basically, whether we use the cleaning or not. We get the same numbers whether we use the larger F sky or the smaller F sky. 
but we don't use the, we use the smaller f sky and use the Clonk likelihood without the 217 uh, detector sets. We get the same numbers as, the, we get this shift of a sigma to, lower, to larger Hubble constant. Um, so it doesn't seem to be the details in the cleaning. Um, you know, the, we see the same spectra whether we clean with 353 or 545, and uh, in both cases, all we see are uh, point sources. Now, one of the nice things about doing cleaning with a higher frequency is, you know, half your sources will have spectral indices above the mean, and half will have spectral indices below the mean, which means half your sources will be, residuals will be positive and half will be negative. That leads to only a Poisson-like term that doesn't lead to a clustering term. So you're not very sensitive. We actually, when we try to do the fit, see no evidence for a residual uh, cluster term. There's just a Poisson term. So it actually simplifies the, the analysis so do, that do way. So you fit a clustering term? We try fitting a clustering term. The best fits around zero, so we've then, we, we do, we've done it both with and without. Mm -hmm. Doesn't make a difference, really. I think what would be interesting would be to, yeah. we, we could compare spectra to spectra. Yes, oh, I have a comparison of the spectra at 217. I flashed that quickly. No. Yeah, this is the one. This is comparing to 143 cross 217. But the difference is mostly out here and a bit here. Um, this, um, the spectrum is a bit closer to the 143 cross 217. In the nominal mission analysis, the, the um, you know, where there was marginal evidence of problems at high multipole, it was the 143217 spectrum that was fitted yeah, I, least well. I guess I just, you know, the null tests like, that were reported were all for the 217, 217s that were, they were you know, in, that were described as, the three failures of the null tests were described as 217, 217s. Um, quick comment. Just to, to add uh, two points. First, about using the 353. I mean, 353 in the concept of Planck was there for which, why didn't we use it uh, uh, to, to go a bit beyond what, what George just said, uh, we have systematics that we did not correct fully, which is this nonlinearity of the uh, analog digital converters. Now, we, did con we, we could correct for that up to 217, the first order term, which was just basically gain variation, were, were corrected. We could not do that for the 353, so we were pretty worried about leaving right. that. Now that's done, and that's done properly all through, so we'll see what it is. Now about your, uh, your question about delivering to the community the detector sets and, and right. so on. Absolutely no quarrel about the principle. Uh, uh, in fact, you, you asked formally right. that, and, and the science team has discussed that, and at least my position as a PI and, and some of my colleagues uh, were on the same line, is that the amount of work to, read, to deliver that to everybody, including everything you need to, uh, as ancillary data, to, to figure out how to use them, will take time. Mm -hmm. And at this stage, it's better than we, we do that for the, the new data, the yeah. new data set, instead of shifting that new data set by six months to, to, to do that on, on, on the first two. So that was the only logic that we probably serve better as a community by doing that directly on the new, on the new data. Than the, yeah. I mean, I, I think all this will be much clearer with five seasons. I mean, I think if there's any, so that's in, but I, I do hope when the five seasons come out, it'd be good to have, you know, be able to reproduce all pieces of the, of the analysis. Yeah. I mean, I was concerned about this issue of whether there was some uh, systematic in 353 or 545, which is why we did the clean one set with 343, one set with 545, and cross-correlated them. So if there was any residual systematic, it, would, it wouldn't show up that way. 
Okay, well, it really is lunchtime, but Joe, you have something compelling to ask very quickly. <laughs> It was just a quick comment as well that, that you, looking at this plot, it looks like it's at elbows from 2000, it might be different. But I think the Planck parameters stabilize by L of 2000, don't they? No, they don't. Mm. The shift is if you take the Planck analysis so, and run it to um, uh, look at the cutoff at 2000 and the cutoff at 2500, if you look at the last figure in paper 16, the shift, that, that shifts it. I have the figure here. Yeah, so this line, this blue line here is for L max of 2000. And the plank is for this black line is L max of 2500. So you can see if you go to 2000, you get the same value of NS that we were getting, uh, not including it. So it's, it's 217 cross 217 beyond 2000. That seems to be playing a, a significant role. Okay, well, and everything goes together, so NS and H0 all tend to go together. Okay, well, today David gets the last word. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure the discussion will continue. Don't forget, for lunch, you want to uh, sit down and then you'll be called uh, to the, uh, to the buffeteria, or, uh, cafeteria, um, the buffet, I mean. Um, and let's thank David again for a very entertaining talk. <laughs>